Good morning. Welcome to today's, to today's Microsoft Virtual Academy, exploring microservices and Docker in Microsoft Azure. Uh, today, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves here. I'm Chris Langford, so I'm a senior product manager at Microsoft uh, for developer tools. I cover both uh, Visual Studio and Azure. And I'm also introduce a special guest that I uh, brought into the studio today uh, to cover market microservice architecture uh, in Windows Azure. Uh, his name's Bob Familiar. Uh, he may be familiar to you. He's, uh, he's been at Microsoft before, but I'll let him do an introduction for himself uh, and his background. Thanks, Chris. So I'm Bob Familiar, the Practice Director for Cloud and Services for Blue Metal Inc. We're a modern application company. We're headquartered in Watertown, Massachusetts. And we also have offices in New York and Chicago. And it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. All right, thanks for showing up, Bob. Uh, today we have a really good agenda for you. Uh, so we're going to cover four modules today. Uh, they're going to be 75 minutes each. Uh, the module one, we're going to talk about microservice architecture uh, in Azure and Docker uh, and all the other container type services that we have uh, available to us to run microservices in. Uh, then we're going to actually see a demo. Uh, I'm actually going to do a demo for containers and microservices in Docker. And then what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to Bob. Uh, he's been working on microservice architecture in Azure uh, with Microsoft.NET. Uh, so we're going to cover a lot of what he's been working on and some, uh, some of those features. Um, and then we're actually going to do a pharma trial demo. So we actually have an application where we're going to be building throughout uh, this session. Uh, and at the end, we're going to bring it all back together. And you're going to see it all running in Azure, uh, cross-platform, um, under a single application. That's right. Uh, which Bob's going to show us here. Right, so if we uh, switch over to my monitor, you'll get a, uh, a preview of you know, what the, uh, the visualization will look like at the end. Understand that there's a lot of Azure behind this that involves a number of different services. Some of them are off the shelf Azure microservices and others are going to be custom built. But at the end of the day, it's all about internet of things and being able to visualize data. Very cool. Uh, so let's get started. So I'm going to hand it over to Bob, and we're going to get, uh, get started with some slides here. We're going to go through that, and then we're going to get into some demos. So our first module is uh, really uh, an introduction to microservices. We're going to take a historical perspective. Um, so we're going to talk about cloud, we're going to talk about continuous delivery, and, and of course, what are microservices, and, and hopefully come up with a, a good definition for you. And, uh, and then we're going to look at a, um, uh, a logical architecture for microservices. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a very good pattern that you can follow to, to design your own microservices. And then we'll look at some uh, different deployment scenarios. Uh, and this is certainly where microservices uh, get very interesting. That's great. So we're going to see all those things, not only in our first session, but we're going to see it throughout the day. Exactly. Uh, and all the demos we're going to do as well. So first topic, evolution of, of software architecture for microservices. So what's interesting is microservices has um, a historical connection, Chris, going all the way back to distributed computing. You go back 20 plus years uh, and we were all working with CORBA and DCOM and, and you know, learning how to use uh, these, these uh, network of computers that we could put together, setting up servers uh, in one area and servers in another, and, uh, and then placing software on those and getting them to communicate uh, over the network. Um, you know, and that uh, didn't necessarily get a wide adoption. It was um, not super performant, and it was fairly heavyweight. But that approach evolved into what became industry standards for, for web services, such as SOAP and REST, and um, eventually to a, a style of software that we now call uh, software as a service. Right. Right, and that's, really, that's a really good point, right? So we've actually done some of the microservice, right, like architecture and kind of building up to where we are today. Uh, and thinking about like the patterns and things that we've used in the past, and, and, and I guess how hardware, right, and, and the abstraction from hardware is changing that model. Right. Exactly, and, so, and, and, and what businesses want is they want to use this approach of software as a service um, to achieve continuous delivery. So from an engineering side, that means that you know, some of the patterns and practices that we've used, used in the past for creating web applications, scalable web applications, may not be the best fit for this software as a service model because we want to be able to deliver updates continuously into production. So be, having, you know, be, doing that with a monolithic application where all your code uh, all, uh, is, is really resident in one large solution that everyone is working on um, doesn't lend itself well to this model of software delivery. Um, 
there's companies that are using this pattern today where they're putting changes into production <clears throat> could be hundreds of times a day. Uh, you know, if that's what the business needs, it's really a business decision about how often you want to um, make these changes in production. But um, engineering has to be ready to support whatever the business needs, right? And if they want updates daily, weekly, monthly, how are you going to do that if you're, if you're uh, using a, a monolithic architecture? Right, and yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, so we've seen a lot of movement around the DevOps area, right, in terms of continuous delivery and continuous deployment, and like you're saying, like how often can I get to production, right? So if that's daily or hourly or you know, on a build, right? Um, thinking about how you break down your application and put that into microservices, right, so that they're easy to deploy, uh, totally makes sense, right? So you can exactly. get to market faster um, and serve the needs of the business. Exactly. Now you combine that with cloud platforms, right? So what do cloud platforms give us, like Azure? They give us on-demand compute and storage, this ability to spin up, you know, VMs, or you know, deploy our, our code into containers that provide all the capabilities that our code needs to run and to provide this very resilient, scalable, fault-tolerant environment for, for our applications. So you, know, you combine that, and of course they're fully automated, right? right? These cloud platforms have APIs, so we can use all the DevOps tools, whether it's PowerShell or Chef or Puppet, um, whatever scripting language uh, is, is uh, the language of choice for your team, and you can automate everything about these cloud platforms. It's really, it's a, they're software data centers that you can deploy your code into and you can make it as scalable and, el and elastic as it needs to be. Right. Um, combine that with this need for continuous delivery and software as a service, we're getting to the point where we really have to rethink our application architecture patterns. They need to, they really need to evolve to fit this model. And so that's where microservices come in. Very cool. So let's walk through this now a little bit more detail about the evolution of architecture. How did we actually get here? <clears throat> so when I think about architecture, you know, I think it's, you know, it's made up of methodology and process, patterns, uh, the platform that you're leveraging, and certainly the devices that you're targeting. You know, as you can tell, if you look at me, Chris, I've been doing this for a while. Um, I'm actually only 29, but I mean, I've been on some very stressful projects, so uh, a fair amount of white hair here. But, you know, uh, the point is, is, you know, you go back, you know, when I got started late 80s uh, and in the 90s, we were using waterfall pro approach to software development, very gated approach. And for those of you who have never been on a waterfall project, you know, it would be broken down into phases and every phase would have tasks and milestones. Right. And you couldn't, you couldn't start phase two until phase one was complete. Yeah. And there was a very rigid handoff between phase one and phase two or whatever phase it was. And so, um, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it ended up not being necessarily the best way to develop software, and, you, and this is where terms like the would come from, or you know, just, just the ability to you know, build a piece of software and get it out the door could take, could take months or years. Right. Um, and we were targeting you know, one or two tier monolithic applications, typically the Windows platform, um, and certainly a desktop uh, environment. Right, and, there's, and, I, and I would say still today, I mean, I've seen you know, customers and people who are still using that type of uh, methodology, right? They're still using waterfall. Right. Um, some of them are kind of subject to it, right? Like gated systems whenever you're in certain verticals like medical industries and things like that. Yeah, that's so, right, there's certain industries um, that require that. Rigor. Right, but they do actually fall back into those you know, two-tier architectures, right? So they actually do have client server or they're doing you know, client you know, module where they're on the machine itself, right? So, right. Uh, so there's a lot of things they need to have in waterfall. So, uh, so that's still a very valid thing to do, but you know, thinking about some of those verticals and some of the things that are happening you know, whenever they're doing waterfall, uh, still doesn't mean that you can't take advantage of the cloud, right? So you can still go, you can take advantage of the cloud. Um, we're actually going to show that today in the demo from a biomedical perspective, right? In that particular industry, waterfall is pretty prevalent. Um, and then still being able to use things like the cloud for IoT capture, right? Exactly. And so, you know, even though, yeah, they might, they might have the rigor of uh, federal oversight, um, you can still uh, take advantage of the velocity that the cloud brings and, and uh, approaches that, that we're going to discuss uh, in, in a little bit for sure. Now, what we did, you know, after, you know, this sort of phase in the industry is we, is, you know, a lot of developers got together and say, well, there's got to be a better way to build software. Right. Uh, something that's, um, you know, more focused on the team and, uh, and uh, is designed around delivering quality at velocity. And so, you know, agile principles and a scrum process uh, have been adopted fairly widely and, and folks who do it well are, are really good at, at delivering software um, at, a, at a very fast pace. 
And certainly through that phase, we were targeting um, you know, a three-tiered layered architecture using you know, domain-driven design um, and, and targeting what uh, you know, it was interesting to actually see how the hardware changed, where the hardware configurations went from you know, desktop server to being now you know, web farms and database clusters. And so our architecture had to evolve right. to fit that model. So we went for a three-tier, which made sense with that kind of a hardware configuration, targeting Windows or Linux uh, or other Unix systems. And the device was really the browser, right? We were going for broad reach. Right. Uh, and so you know, the front end of these applications were HTML, uh, JavaScript. Right, and I think that's a lot of, it's a time when a lot of the things like SOAP and WCF and those type technologies where we're having middle tier architecture uh, were born right during that time exactly. for flexibility right and being able to deploy and 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 I think we took care of the client side on that right we were able to go and deploy and de you know send out an exe right with .NET and things like that right. uh, or update a web form right it's pretty easy to do right. uh, but now that we have you know super sophisticated backends right and and we have now you know abstraction from that hardware uh, you know I think the move from agile and Scrum and those sort of methodologies. Uh, and software development, and, and just the the idea that we're moving from in a technology perspective, we're kind of advancing, right? Um, exactly. We're, we're moving more to and the motion around DevOps, right? Being in engineering, so we need to be able to you know put pressure on software development to you know not take two years to get into production or six months, right? It has to be you know on a weekly or daily or hourly basis. Right? Exactly. So what we want to do now, in taking advantage of the cloud as our platform is adopting you know, methodology like lean engineering, as you mentioned. So lean engineering says, you know, we want to uh, do things in small batches. We want to start with minimal viable products. Um, we want to fail fast and be able to change direction in case we, we happen to you know, try something out and it doesn't, it's not right for, the, for our customers. We want to be able to say, well, we can change that and we can change it quickly. Um, and so lean engineering, uh, along with Agile and Scrum uh, and, and uh, uh, adopting this you know, automation through your engineering process to, to have continuous delivery on, on a cloud uh, platform, in order to do that, you, you need to use a microservice architecture. That becomes the best pattern that combines all of those, the, the process, the methodology, the platform, the, the, pa the architectural pattern is microservices. Right, and, and I think we've talked about this as well. So as you go and you start to you know, adopt things like lean engineering, um, what, you find, what you find when you're doing those sort of practices is you start to see that your application does get broken down into slices, right? So if it is still is a monolithic, you found some way to do like domain-driven design or something that allows you to have flexibility to do continuous deployment, right, in those sort of environments. So I think what we're going to talk about here today is how to go a step further than domain-driven design, right, and, and provide microservices and still have an entire application, but deployment in, inside of microservices becomes much easier. Exactly. We want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, be able to do that and target any device. So we've gone from desktop to browser to now the solutions that we're um, uh, building, designing, and, and putting up into the cloud need to support certainly uh, desktops, but tablets and phones and right. wristwatches and HoloLens and lamp posts and uh, vehicles, Cars, buildings, right, yeah. um, thermostats, you name it, right? So we, we want to get to the point where the software is broken down into, into these microservices that can be composed into solutions that create an experience on the target device. Very cool. Here's another way I like to look at it. Again, I'm very much, I like pictures. It helps me you know, get, wrap my head around you know, these concepts. So kind of walking through the evolution again, but let's look at it in a pictorial way. We, we started out with these you know, monolithic applications targeting desktop. And then the, the uh, network computing and the idea that we could actually you know, leverage databases on one server and the de rich desktop application on the client, we found a way to, to put a slice through our architecture, uh, and we called it client server, right? right? So we took some of the code and it was on the client, we put another bunch of code and it was on, on the server side. Right. And as we move forward uh, into, uh, uh, you know, the internet came and we said, okay, now we're gonna learn how to build highly scalable web applications that target browsers. We took sort of another slice through our architecture. And we said, you know, some of the code is gonna run in the browser, some code is gonna run on a web server, and of course, some code might exist in a database. Right, and we uh, still had server. clients at that point too as well, right? So we had, exactly. you know, I remember applications where you'd have WPF and you'd have, you know, uh, you know, the browser and they'd be connected to a middle tier, right? And then back to the server at that point to databases. Right, so I think we've gotten very good 
at, at doing these, these uh, horizontal slices through our architecture. Right. And I think with microservices, what we find is we now are going to start to do vertical slices right. through, our, through our architectures. We're going to say, you know, what we need to do is find um, uh, these, these areas of capability um, and isolate them, and, and uh, they will become units of deployment. And in fact, what you'll notice the way I've drawn it here is they also might have their own store. Right. So each one could have a different way of storing the data that's, that is relevant to that area of the, of the solution. Yeah, that's a great point, right? So when you have microservices and you think about like storage that you might have in your database, right? So you know, thinking about transactional versus document storage versus blob storage and those sort of things, right? So thinking about you know, the different storage types and whenever you start to combine a monolithic application, right, you kind of get you know, like sucked into doing one you know, sort of transactional like database or you know document database sort of thing so when you're doing the microservices and you have different data stores you can really do the one that's going to you know provide you the best flexibility and performance for your slice of your application yes but it will have an impact downstream on maybe how you would do reporting right. for that solution and again you know there are ways you can leverage microservices for that as well right and we're going to talk about some of those as well so some of those you know we're going to build some microservices but we're actually going to use some microservices uh, that are in Azure as well today in the demos uh, things like stream analytics are going to allow us to intercept some of those things where we could actually possibly do some of that reporting and, and take the burden off of having to you know, aggregate back those data sets. Exactly. And if we go back to the diagram, the, the last part of the build, it's, it's showing that you know, each of these microservices are, are exposing uh, a programmable interface. Um, and in order to provide you know, some level of management and control over top of that, there, there, are, um, there are services uh, available uh, from third parties, but certainly it's, you know, it's built right into Azure that allow you to do what's called API management. Uh, and this adds you know, additional capabilities for defining proxies, for doing policy injection, um, adding additional layers of security, uh, documentation, sub developer subscription, there's a lot there. And we'll actually take a look at API management a little later today. Very cool. And of course, at the end, we want to be able to target any device. So now we're going to dig into, you know, peel, peeling away the onion, we're going to go a little deeper and we're going to actually, you know, try to create a definition for, for a microservice. All right. Now, the way I like to kick off this discussion is, as you can see there, I've got, you know, an image of a stapler. It might make you think of, you know, one of your favorite movies. Um, or, uh, you know, what I liked, the way I, the point I'm trying to make, though, with this image, though, if you think about a stapler, Right. right? Chris, a stapler does what? Yeah, it staples really well, right? Staples, right. and it does it really well. It does one thing, and it does it really well. So if you were looking for sort of the, the shortest description of a microservice, that would be it. It right. does one thing, and it does it really well. Yeah, I, possibly you could use a stapler as a hammer. Probably doesn't work as well. <laughs> right? but, uh, well, you might hurt yourself. You might. Yeah, yeah. We you don't recommend staple, that, by the way. It could staple really well, yeah. But we actually want to go a little bit deeper. So, um, you know, I think the first uh, property or behavior of a microservice is that um, it's autonomous. And by that we mean it's a self-contained unit of functionality uh, with what's loosely coupled um, dependencies on other services uh, within the environment. So you really need to look at a microservice and say, hey, you know, does this one thing, it does it really well, so it's going to be you know, uh, designed and built uh, independently. It's autonomous, it's also isolated, right? right? It's a unit of deployment. I can code it, I can test it, I can move it into staging, move it into production without having any other uh, relationship to other parts of the system. And that's very important. Right. You start to think about your solutions today and, and that monolithic nature. You know, you make a change to a monolithic application, you fix a bug, you've got to, you know, do unit testing across the whole thing, regression testing at, at right. a certain percentage, and then deploy that entire block of code. Microservices, the approach is, you know, let's, let's define just the capability that it represents, isolate it, build it independently, and deploy it independently. Right, and so I think about you know the the autonomous piece of that, and and you know what you really have to look out for whenever you're making changes to a, to a microservice is really that um, the point where you actually have dependencies or, or or other microservices have dependencies on you to make sure that you don't break functionality, right? Uh, but if you're doing things which which normally happens in the mod model or the um, you know the database connection, right, th that layer of it, right. uh, if you're making those sort of changes, really applications don't care about that, right? They just care that they can call the API and they get what they expect back, right? So. Um, so thinking about like how you make it autonomous in that piece of it, uh, and thinking also how you know 
the dependencies that other services have on you, I guess, is really important, right? Right. So there have to be some very well-defined contracts, right. and uh, and we'll get into it. You know, they, there's there's an aspect of versioning and so on that goes on there as well. Right. But certainly, we want the, them to be elastic, right? And and so the uh, microservice can be stateful or stateless, but um, they need to be scalable, right? They need to be able to scale up and scale down uh, as needed, and and. In a lot of ways, if we're leveraging cloud platform, that's going to come from that environment and, and the ability to configure that for right. our, our microservices. And, and, and uh, that's, that's something that will come from the environment. The environment will provide that for us. Right. And I think it's a really good point. Uh, you know, you talk about a little bit about stateless and stateful. Um, so, so, you know, we've, We've been drawn back and you know, like using SOAP services and WCF, right, and the client side to be kind of stateless, right? And whenever you're doing web farms, right, you know, to not to depend on things like sessions or things like that, where you have to have state across multiple uh, requests. Uh, but thinking about some of the other services that are in, in Azure today, right? So, so Redis Cache being a service, right, a microservice that you can just spin up and use uh, as a really great option uh, for having that stateful piece of it, right? Exactly. So there are services within Azure that, that are microservices right. and they're stateful. Right. Um, I, would, I would say though, from what I've seen is the majority of microservices that you'll do are very likely stateless. Right. But you'll leverage stateful services like Redis or even SQL Database uh, to provide that, that stateful nature. Right. Uh, resilient, of course. Uh, it needs to be fault tolerant and highly available. Right. Again, configuring that properly in, a, in, a, in, in Azure will provide that. Responsive, everyone wants responsive, right? right. It needs to, be, needs to return the data in a reasonable amount of time, and, and of course that, that is going to come from rigorous testing and, and, uh, and good design. Right. Intelligent, now this one, um, is a, a bit more of a sophisticated concept. It's this idea, you know, we look back at the early evolution of um, service-oriented architecture. There was a lot of work that went into creating products that did what was called an enterprise service bus. Right. The idea there is that there would be this piece of software running on a server that would provide, you know, interoperability with different platforms and systems. That That's good. Right. Um, it would provide, um, you know, uh, uh, data transformation services, so a message might come in in one format and be applied, a schema would be applied and it would, it would come out a, a different format. Right. Um, it would provide orchestration, so long running transactions. Um, this, this was uh, useful in a lot of scenarios, but when we think about a microservice architecture, we really want to move away from that. That's kind of the anti-pattern because with an enterprise service bus, all of that knowledge uh, about those orchestrations, that, that interoperability, um, those long-running transactions, is captured in one place. It right. becomes a single point of failure. Right, and I love that the logic's all kind of combined in your microservice, so it's combined in your slice. Um, I still do think there's a place for you know the enterprise service bus or the service bus mechanism, right? It's a front yes. end to provide you some high availability and queuing and stuff like that, right? So there's, there's definitely some availability and, and yeah. things that you can le lean on those services for. Um, especially in Azure. It, it, yes, there's certainly the loosely coupled nature. Right. Uh, uh, those patterns absolutely apply in leveraging capabilities of Azure like Service Bus to, to provide that, and we'll see again, so we'll see some of that right. today. Um, message oriented, that's you know, related to that. So the idea that um, microservices will rely on, on asynchronous message passing um, to establish boundaries uh, between components. They're programmable. Um, they provide APIs, and you know it's popular today to, to leverage uh, REST, but certainly um, it could be done uh, with SOAP. Uh, but the point is, is there is a an industry standard uh, way to to uh, interoperate with these microservices. You know, it could also be a queue, right? That might be another way that you would you would program that that service as you you'd, be, you'd pass it a message. Right, you decide to get messages. Very cool. Right. And this next one is, is something that um, you know, may not be apparent as when you think about this. Most developers, you think about, oh, I'm going to build some APIs. I bet you there's a lot of folks watching today that said, yeah, I know how to build a REST API. But when you think about a microservice, really think of it more not just an API, and even not just its data contract, which is also very important. Think of it as a product, right? And a product is something that has um, a well-defined set of capabilities. It has a programmable interface. It has that data contract. It has documentation. And we'll see maybe how you would be, deliver that okay. uh, using a cloud platform. But they're also configurable in the sense that there's not only a public API, but there's very likely a, uh, an administrative API. 
uh, that might be used for, for uh, bootstrapping, um, for providing you know, um, metrics or you know, the configuration settings. Right. Um, and typically, there's also a user interface associated with that uh, configuration part of the microservice. So again, you think about more like a product and that it, you know, it might have a UI aspect to it that's all about its configuration, and it has a programmable API and you know a uh, a data model that it that expects to use. So all, and documentation, all that wrapped up, um, is a I think a, a new way for us to think about how we're uh, designing and deploying these these software uh, microservices. Think of them as products, and then right. that that allows you to take ownership uh, in that and take pride in its in the quality. Okay. And automated, of course, we talked about that, the DevOps aspect. We need to be able to script these. We need to be able to take them from uh, um, coding through, through various levels of testing to staging and production and automate that as, as much as possible. Right, and when I think about that too, right, like going from monolithic, right, and, and the reason why monolithic apps are so hard to move through a DevOps cycle, right, is that it's just really hard to automate all the pieces that are wrapped into a monolithic app, right? So when we start to take a look here, whenever we break down microservices, um, there's a lot of out-of-box functionality that we can use, right, that just helps us get through um, that automation piece, right? It's pretty easy to script a microservice, um, especially when your target is the cloud, right? So, right, right. Um, you know, being able to reach an API in Azure that lets you scale up and scale down and create new environments um, along with your automation is going to be really cool. And since the surface area of these microservices is, is smaller than a complete solution, right. uh, they, they're more manageable. Uh, they're in, as we said, they're independent, they're isolated, they're units of deployment. Um, taking that, that um, um, just that part of your solution and being able to automate it is going to be uh, a lot easier than trying to automate something that's you know, 10 or 15 or 20 times the size of that. Cool, and I, and I think too today, we're gonna show a little bit of you know, how we're gonna break those down into you know, smaller surface areas per slice, right, from a microservice perspective. Uh, but we're actually going to show how to aggregate those surface areas back right into an application. So, uh, you know, when your users are using it, right, it's not just individual microservice products, right? It's a it's a bigger solution uh, that they can get access to. Exactly. Now, some of the benefits that you'll see if you were to adopt a microservice approach to your solutions is it can be evolutionary. Uh, so this idea that you know you might have a monolithic application today. Um, so you might say, well, how could I, I'm not, you just don't want to re, re-architect that entire thing as right. microservices. Maybe you would say, well, there's a certain piece of that application. I could cleave that off and I could, I could say, okay, we're going to take just that capability that we have and make that a microservice and have that interoperate in a loosely coupled way with the existing monolithic solution minus the capability you just cleaved off. Right. And then over time, continue uh, to do that, that uh, uh, migration of capabilities into microservices. Right, or we can actually just start there, right? So if we're adding functionality to an existing monolithic app, exactly. just create it as a microservice and integrate it into the app um, that's existing. Exactly, now, I'm not gonna say that's not without its challenges, all right? right. So, so uh, you know, I've, uh, there are many um, uh, large enterprise systems today that have been around a while and have been you know, built up uh, over time with lots of different developers kind of having their, their way with it <laughs> over right. the years. And sometimes these solutions end up being kind of a big ball of mud right. and it's hard to find the seams. Uh, so we'll talk about maybe some, some techniques for finding those seams. Okay. Um, we want it to be open, so it's language agnostic. So what's interesting is you could actually um, have different microservices built in different technology stacks in different languages. Yep. And again, we'll take a look at that today. that today. But bring them together into solutions. So you might have certain development teams that have skills in Node.js and others that have skills in Java and others in C Sharp. Um, and, but guess what? They can all play together in this world of microservices right. because at the end of the day, they're building software uh, that is accessible via standard APIs. Very cool. Resilient, the benefits there, certainly leveraging cloud platform for resiliency. Right. Speed of development, I've seen you know, this effect where certainly because, again, the surface area of a microservice is smaller than a complete solution, you can build them faster, you can design them faster, you can get results faster, and of course, if you're using a lean engineering approach, you can take that iter high velocity iterative approach, right. start with a minimal viable product, and then just evolve it a little bit over time, adding capability till you have you know, the complete uh, set of, uh, the complete scope that you need for that microservice. Service. Right, and we're going to get reused because of the because it's all based on you know standard uh, interfaces. We can uh, leverage them from many different situations. Right, and we'll also show today too like 
code reuse. Like a lot of people are concerned about code reuse when they're thinking about like smaller services and having to rewrite the same code over and over again, right? So uh, we're going to show some techniques, obviously, in your demo where you're actually going to show code reuse. Um, I'm going to do the open source demo today, so we could do some in there as well, right? If we're doing file sharing and symbolic sharing and stuff like that. So, uh, so there's a lot of ways to get code reuse across microservices. Yes, you know, that doesn't go away for sure. Now, some additional benefits, we've touched upon this already. So deployment governance, they're deployed independently, they're scaled independently. So if you think about this, you know, today, if you have a monolithic solution and you will put that in the cloud, which you can do, right. um, and you said, well, we want to scale that up. Well, you have to take the entire block of code that you have, the entire solution, and then clone that on as many VMs or across as many instances uh, um, you know, in order to get the level of scale you need across the entire solution. But that right. might not be give you the best return on investment of your, of your cloud resources. Right. If you had microservices, you could actually have independent uh, scale profiles for each of your microservices. Yeah, and that's a really good point. So thinking about like how you slice up your application, uh, you talked a little bit about boundaries and seams in the application where you might go and split it up. Uh, another good way to might be to you know actually like profile your application and think about you know what what paths or what workflows in my code are being called most of the time, right? So if that ends up being a slice of your application, right? That's one of the things maybe you want to scale up, and you don't need the other parts to be scaled out, right? If they're different exactly. slices, so exactly, and that and that's. You know, you know who's really going to love that? Whoever's paying the bill for the cloud platform is going to love that because you're going to be able to say, look, you know, we can take advantage of the cloud and we're only going to pay for what we absolutely need. Right. Uh, and that's, that's really key. Um, these microservices are replaceable, you know, because um, th they are, uh, represent just a, a, a certain amount of capability. We could say, well, you know, there's, there's version one of that, of the, let's say, the workflow uh, microservice. And then, uh, you know, six months later, we say, well, you know, now we're ready. We're going to go to version two. Oh, by the way, we can since we're versioning them, we can actually have them running side by side. Right. Anyone who's using version one can keep using version one. We're going to introduce version two. Right. Uh, and now folks are using version two, and over time, maybe they migrate to version two. And when you know no one's using version one, you can take it offline. Right. So, so having this this ability to have um, you know multiple versions running simultaneously, being able to manage that, right. uh, that's very powerful. Yeah, and that's very cool because when you think about that, it's not it's not like we're doing versioning in the same vertical slice of our application. We actually have two slices for you know version one and version two, right? So uh, so we can maintain them independently. They can share code base, right? So we can right. do deployments and you know do fixes and things like that for the version one. Uh, but we can move forward and actually do deployments and, and innovate, right? Without having to go back and you know make sure we're bringing our customers with us, right? We can just leave version one around, let them you know have time to make the jump to version two, uh, exactly. which is super important. Exactly. And finally, owned. What do I mean by that? One of the things I've also seen in working with uh, with our clients in adopting these microservice uh, approaches is that it can absolutely have an impact on how you organize your teams. Right. Um, if you if you are organized um, in you know more of that waterfall style where you've got you know separate developments, separate QA, they might even be on different floors in the building, uh, you know, different parts of the world, um, you know, it, it uh, may not lend itself right. to this microservice approach. If you think about, again, a microservice as a product, you very likely want to form a team that's going to own that microservice from the design all the way through to production. Right. So what kind of skills are you going to put on that team? You're going to need you know, developers, QA, you're going to need DevOps, uh, probably an architect, there's a scrum master, you know, product owner, all of that right. goes into um, uh, the type of team you'd like to form that will own a microservice throughout its entire life cycle. Right. Think of it as a product, and th that will serve you well if you adopt this approach. Right, and I've actually seen a different lens on that. So what I've seen is, you know, I've seen customers go and they actually create the teams first, right, with the skill sets they need for a particular team. Um, and then they go and they start taking pieces of the application. Uh, and what you see over time is that they start doing designs, even if it's in a monolithic, right? That they start slicing up the application so that they don't have dependencies on other teams, right? Right. Uh, which is really cool. So, exactly. so if you're thinking about you know, how you split up your app and how you split up your teams, right? Um, they're kind of a natural fit when you start doing you know, lean engineering approaches, right? And, and if you start from that side first, process side, uh, your, your application will, you know, if you stick with it long enough, will actually form into um, slices, right? Even if it is monolithic. Right, and if you're starting off on the other side, which is you know microservices, um, obviously going to that side, to that type of process and that type of type of team formation uh, makes sense. Absolutely, and I think another, the last point I'll make on this is there are a lot of uh, clients today who have 
their team spread out across the world. Right. And there is a challenge if you're working on a monolithic solution in getting communication, let's say, from the team in the U.S. to the team in Europe to the team uh, in Asia and getting, you know, that you know communication to happen 24 7 right as as everyone is working on this very large body of code all right. working on the same solution you know has impact on just just you know uh the uh, the build and 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 qa cycles for 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 all of that if you're using a microservices approach you could actually have <clears throat> each of those teams be working on different microservices right so therefore you've now decoupled uh, that there's the dependencies are not there because these microservices are isolated and autonomous, right. and they will come together. Uh, let's say through uh, uh, the the team that's building the user experience and is and is actually now using those microservices to create the the experience for whatever device. Right. Yeah, and that's kind of interesting too. So what you've done is you've done you've done two things. You've decoupled the code, right, so it can yes. be isolated and deployed independently. Uh, but you've also decoupled the teams, right, yes. and their dependencies, so that they can be autonomous as well. Which is which is where we strive to be from a lean engineering perspective, right? Like all the teams need to be autonomous, um, and with a few dependencies or no dependencies on other teams, right? Exactly. So now, of course, microservices are not without their challenges. Um, as, as we just talked about, you know, if you've got teams that are working on microservices, communication is key. Uh, how do they all know about what these APIs are and what they can do? How do you communicate that and make it consistent right. across all the microservices? And how do you, you really want to think about branding your API across these microservices and, you know, uh, and, and that has implications. So that's, that's critical. Automation, as we discussed, not an option. You really need to have your DevOps uh, uh, story uh, uh, in place and aligned with, with right. the work you're doing. Yeah, that's really key because, you know, whenever you're targeting the cloud, specifically Azure, right, there's a lot of automation already built in, right, to doing deployment. So, you know, if you're doing things like cloud services where you're doing packaging or you're, you know, you're using web deploy and app services or websites, right, um, and then having those auto scale up and scale down mechanisms and, and uh, you know, creating staging slots and things like that and websites is, uh, it's really key from a DevOps perspective um, and leveraging a lot of that functionality out of the box um, it totally makes sense when you start to do microservices. Exactly. Of course, the platform matters. You want to have a platform that's right. going to deliver all those capabilities. Um, versioning, you need to support it. Uh, we, you know, that has to be a, a part of the way you design these. Right. Domain modeling. Um, so if you have rich domains, you know, of existing monolithic applications, um, but if you did a good job through that process and you did domain-driven uh, um, design, it's very likely you're, you could be set up well for moving to microservices, because if you can look at your domain model and find where the language changes and where the seams are across the different parts of your model, right. you can say, well, you know, that's a micro that part right there that's all kind of related to the same capability, that's a microservice. And so you could actually use domain modeling um, to, to find out you know, where, where the seams are in, in your system. Right. Um, testing. Uh, certainly is going to get a bit more complex because you are now you have uh, instead of one solution that might go through a whole series of automated right. tests, you may have many microservices, each with their own suite of tests right. that are going to test the internals, the internal capabilities, unit testing in the code itself, yeah. um, testing the protocol at the protocol level, um, the API, the, you know, the, the contract, and then uh, so that's the, uh, the extra service uh, testing, and then how it's all composed together right. needs to be tested. When you bring all those microservices together yeah. for an experience, you've got to test that as well. Right. And then I think from a testing perspective, whenever you're thinking about testing a microservice, I think it becomes easier, right? Because you don't have dependencies. We don't have to spin up extra data sets or you know, data stores or things like that, right? We can just go in and we can test our slice of this. Um, hopefully we've made our tests where we can aggregate them into a bigger pool of tests when we start to integrate them back together in something like API management. Yes, yes. And of course, discoverability. And we'll, we'll take a look at discoverability, uh, that concept and how you might uh, handle that with your microservices. It's all about saying, well, you know, I have an application, how does it find out about all the microservices that it's going to use, uh, both at, at uh, design time, code time, as well as runtime, and how might it do it dynamically? And that might be a, a benefit to your solution, and we'll discuss how you might accomplish that uh, dynamically. Very cool. Now, if you're domain modeling uh, an existing system, you've got um, uh, um, an existing monolithic app, how might you find those seams as we discussed? We talked about the domain model itself, the bounded context. That, that could be a place where you would find where the microservices are. You might say, well, you know, where are things changing uh, a lot? 
uh, uh, in my system or where they're not changing very often. And those could be opportunities to say that's where those micro, the microservices are. Right. Um, how you organize the team, as you mentioned earlier, if, they're, if, you've, if you have teams that are sort of working on different areas of the solution, that might be the way you say, well, we're going to work there and say, let's find the microservices um, in the teams, the way the team structure, the uh, uh, way you're organized. Right. Um, where might you be having pain? Yeah, I like how uh, you called that out. That's <laughs> whatever fun, hurts right? most might be a good candidate. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one to Cleave laugh it. at, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and of course, there are tools to do namespace modeling. And this is kind of cool. You can use a tool to go in and especially if you've got you know, a system with millions of lines of code. Right. Maybe you're not the first person to have worked on this system, but now you're responsible for it, right? Right. Uh, the, and you might say, well, you know, I don't really understand the full system. Well, namespace modeling tools will, will create at least a visual diagram that says, you know, all the, all the code that is using these namespaces is kind of over here. Right. These namespaces are over there. And you can, there, you can see all the connected lines, all the dependencies between them, which is important. Um, but you also see kind of how the code might be organized, and those might be opportunities for right. microservices. Right. And there's some great tools actually in Visual Studio. I just just thinking about that. There's some great architectural tools that do architectural diagrams, right? Exactly. That if you have so if you have an existing .NET code base, you can actually just uh, show that diagram. It'll show you the big blocks of namespaces, right? And then you can drill into them if you need to. Absolutely. Get started with Visual Studio. Um, I've also used a tool called Endepends, and which is which is very good as well. There's right. there's other tools out there, but right. it it uh, you use the tools at your disposal uh, right. to essentially analyze the code and kind of figure out how it's all put together. Right. Um, if you're starting uh, in a greenfield, either you're adding new capability to a monolithic application or you're really starting from scratch, certainly the user stories are going to be where you're going to discover your microservices. And you can start, again, just one at a time, have it be evolutionary, a minimal viable product approach, right. that lean engineering uh, 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 style of um, uh, methodology. Single responsibility, remember, they do one thing and they do it really well right. and leverage loose coupling and then you'll be on a good track uh, for building a solution out of microservices. Right. So now we're going to look at a, a logical architecture for microservices. Uh, and what will be interesting here is as we dig into this, you're going to say, well, I, I, I kind of already designed my software like this. Hopefully, right. we'll see. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's still a layered approach, but it's within the context of a microservice. So good engineering practices don't go away. We're going to carry them forward. We're just going to now apply them uh, to, to these vertical slice of capability yeah. as opposed to an, uh, a, a large monolithic system. Right, and that's a really good point, right? So we're still doing all the same things that we do, right? Software is software. We're building software, right. um, fault tolerant enterprise software, right? So, and we're basically just taking vertical slices of that. Um, and so what we have is all the same pieces and functionality in place with just, you know, it's, it's just smaller, right? So it's a slice of those big monolithic apps. Exactly. So if we look at the logical architecture here, uh, diagram, you'll see at the base, we have our store. So there'll be some uh, way of storing uh, the models, as we refer right. to them, the, the, the data contracts that are related to this microservice. And um, it, this could be a relational store, it could be a NoSQL store, it could be Azure storage. <laughs> it, you know, it, 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 it can come in many forms. Um, it certainly is popular to use NoSQL for, for many of these today because these, these models, we tend to move them around the wire as JSON and, and these right. NoSQL stores are great at, at uh, you know, storing JSON. So you know, we'll take a look at examples there, but it's certainly not the only way to do it. Right. You'll have a data access tier in the architecture. So that bit of code, and this is, this is where you might see some reuse uh, across your microservices. Of course, you're going to look for, there'll be common frameworks and common libraries that all the teams will use. Uh, and data access is, is, is a common one. Other yeah. cross-cutting concerns, maybe how you do logging and exception handling and, um, uh, you know, and uh, other cross-cutting concerns like that might be right. where you'll look for reuse. Yeah, and hopefully the data access layer, right? If you're doing a microservice, you know, hopefully you don't have a bunch of microservices reading from the same data store, right? Like it's, like you're just maybe, you know, doing vertical slices, but still being, you know, subject to the same data storage, right? So, so I think, you know, to our point earlier, having maybe different data storage for each one of those um, doesn't have to be, but it's certainly a good practice when you're creating a microservice, right? Exactly, and, and so, but, but where there's reuse is that how you communicate this storage right. is pretty common right. across all of them, even though they might be pointing to different locations. Right. Um, above that is the service layer, and the service layer is really where, you know, the, it's the implementation 
of your service. And we want to call that out separately. We want a good separation of concern between uh, data access, which is below, and the protocol, which is above. Because we might take this service and its data access, and we might actually use it with a different protocol. So today we might be using you know, HTTP and REST. Right. Tomorrow we might choose to do something else, TCP, IP, and you know, go, go uh, a, a different route for how you can communicate to that service. Right. So making sure you do good separation of concerns uh, there in the implementation itself. We have our models, and I kind of drew that in the middle, because the models are, are what are passed over the wire uh, between client and, and the service itself. Right. And then from the service, usually then stored uh, in in, uh, in in some kind of a, a database. Right. So we can think of those as you know data transfer objects, right? So those are the things that we're going to pass between and the structures, right? So is it going to be XML? Is it going to be JSON? Exactly. Right? Uh, those sort of items. And these are the things we're going to serialize and deserialize in and out of objects at runtime. Right. Uh, in our code. Now, at the, at the protocol level. That's where we're defining our API um, for a particular wire protocol, like REST and over HTTP. Um, you could stop there, and you could just say to anyone who wants to consume your service, Here's my, here are my REST endpoints. Right. Um, have at it. Uh, you know, most everyone knows how to call a REST API, whether it's from JavaScript or C Sharp. Um, but there is one additional step you could take. It's optional. Um, and that is to create an SDK over top of right. your API. Now, the benefit here is you've just made it easier for anyone to adopt your API. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's great. If, uh, if you create a C Sharp SDK for your API, C Sharp developers now can very easily just get that SDK. Um, that's all they really need to bring into their code. Right. Uh, they instantiate your SDK object, uh, your client object, and start calling uh, the methods on that, and that will turn into REST calls back to your service okay. and makes it easy to adopt it. Um, the downside, though, is if you, whatever you build, you're responsible for, right? right? So if you say, well, we're going to build SDKs for JavaScript and C Sharp and PHP and, you know, J uh, Java, you name it, right? There's a lot of languages out there, a lot of different platforms. How, how many SDKs are you going to build and support? And all of a sudden, you know, you're in the SDK business, right? right? So you have to decide, do you want to be in the SDK business or not? As I said, it's optional. Uh, it's certainly, uh, if you know your audience, let's say, is always going to be C-sharp developers, you can say, okay, that's pretty easy. We'll, we'll support one C-sharp SDK. Right. You know, it, that's, that's a decision that you'll have to make. Right. And even though you have that, you still have the REST API. So if you want, yes. you know, if, if other developers want to come in that are you know, not 80% of your target or with the majority, right, then they can come back in and, and leverage the REST APIs. Exactly. And of course, along the left-hand side there, we have automation. We want to make sure every aspect of what we're uh, uh, building is, is scriptable uh, through, you know, through the build, test, uh, being deployed into, into staging and into production you know, across the board. And you know, for example, you, know, you might say, well, our SDKs, we're going to make them available through NuGet, right? Uh, and, and you go there and download the SDK, and now right. you've just automated uh, the, the ability of developers to very easily get your SDK and, and leverage it cool. um, you know, as, as an example. So that's the logical architecture. One thing, as I've worked on a number of systems, is as, as we look back at the diagram here, is I have found that, that, and I mentioned this earlier, there's both a public, S, public API that you'll find as you go through your design effort, but there's also a private API. There are things that you're going to want to um, make available through uh, REST API programming that you don't want everyone to have access to. Right. It might be, hey, we, we need an administrative aspect to our microservice that provides um, you know, adding, uh, updating data. You know the the uh, the create update and delete operations. Those are all private, but the read but it might be so it's not a read only microservice. You right. want the, the all the Git operations are public, but those other CRUD operations we want to make private because we want to have control over the data that's in that microservice, and we just want to make it um, uh, readable by by anybody. So as you go through and you're designing your services, you may find there are some APIs that you don't want everyone to have access to, and others that you do. So there's this two sides to a microservice. There is the public side and the private side, and uh, just wanted to call that out. And so, you know, created a little uh, uh, slice in uh, uh, through this, the logical architecture to, to make that point. Okay. So in this last uh, section of, to, of today's opening uh, module, we're going to talk about microservice deployment scenarios. Okay. So now we've built our microservices, and we want to deploy them into the cloud, what are some of the different ways that we can do that?
Well, when we think about uh, our microservices, again, one of the ideas is we want to make sure that we're, um, we want to be able to build experiences across many different devices. Right. And to do that, you might decide, as we talked about earlier, that different microservices will have different scale profiles. Reference data might say, well, that gets called you know, not too frequently, so you know, we'll have one or two instances of that. Product catalog, hey, everyone's always looking up product catalog, we better have three, four, five instances of that to be able to handle the scale. Um, workflow, that's occasional. Uh, customers, maybe occasional, but ordering, boy, we're really popular. We're, <laughs> a lot of products are being put into shopping carts and they're being checked out. Man, we're gonna have, you know, we need a lot of, uh, we need you know, tens or hundreds of, of instances of our order processing microservice. Right. Um, and I think, you know, what you also have to be prepared for as you, as you bring these solutions like this into production is these scale profiles will change over time because you're going to discover as you're creating different experiences across different devices, um, users are going to use the system maybe in ways you didn't expect. Right. And so therefore certain microservices might become hotspots that you didn't expect to become hotspots. But guess what? It's in a cloud platform, it's elastic, and if you configure it to be elastic, you can say, yeah, by, def by default it only has two instances, but I want it to be able to scale up to 20. Right. Because I, I, and, and, and you just set that as a setting, and now all of a sudden there's only two instances there, but if that becomes a hotspot, the cloud will automatically scale up to handle the load, and that's, that's where you really get you know, leveraging the power of the cloud. Right, and I think a key point about your, uh, your slide here is that you know, we're, we're talking a lot about the microservices. We haven't talked too much about the client side of it. We, we mentioned it earlier when right. we had the architecture for that. Um, but you, know, you talked about it earlier, right? We have watches, we have tablets, we have phones, right? So there's billions and billions of devices out there that are opportunities, right? if you have a service, um, whether they're native or HTML or thick client, right, uh, to connect back to your services. So, um, so you never know how many you're going to get, right, to your right. point. Um, so having that elasticity approach um, and starting off that way um, is a very good way to start from a microservice perspective. Exactly. Now, when you think about using VMs in the cloud, you know, that's one approach. And you can, you can take a microservice and you say, I'm going to put a microservice on a VM. Right. Um, and then for, for you know, certain microservices, you're going to have multiple VMs. And again, each VM having uh, one uh, instance of that microservice code base. And you could scale it that way. Kind of thinking of it uh, as if they're far service, you know, farms or servers. That's mm -hmm. one sort of mental model that you could use. Um, if you're using Azure, this is concept of web hosting plans and resource groups. Right. And within the definition of those, you control the elasticity. Uh, so you could deploy microservices into specific web hosting resor and w resource groups so that you can control the elasticity model for each of those. Right. That's another approach, using the platform as a service side. So we talk about the infrastructure as a service approach, right. the platform as a service approach. Yeah, and this is a really, really interesting point. So yeah. you know, we've, we've made a lot of announcements recently, right? So there's a lot of ways to get to microservices in Azure, right? There's, right. there's websites, there's cloud services, there's app services, there's um, the um, service fabric. Serv service fabric, yeah, sorry, thank no, you. No, no thank problem. You. Uh, That's so, why I'm here. So new I just <laughs> couldn't get it out there. So, uh, so service fabric. So there's a lot of options for you to go out uh, and create microservices, to create your own microservices. Uh, but there's also a lot of existing microservices that you can add to your plans, right? So we talked about read as cache, we yeah. talked about you know, service bus, document DB, SQL as a service, right? There's, there's a ton of other services you can add uh, that do things really well, right? So you don't exactly. need to go and reinvent the wheel. Right, and uh, my, my mental model of Azure, only because I, you know, a lot of the, uh, to nearly all the projects that we're working on with our clients are, are using a microservice approach as I think of Azure as a microservice platform. And there are built-in microservices and I'm going to bring in some custom microservices and I'm going to compose that combination to the, into the solution that I need for my, for my client. Right. Um, following on the Azure model here, if over time you discover that, you know, the, the usage patterns across uh, your, your microservices changes, you can certainly change how you deploy your microservices. Again, this is all scriptable. So this, this can be done on the fly, uh, dynamically, uh, or maybe if you're using um, the fact that you can deploy across multiple regions around the world, you might have one uh, uh, approach you use in one part of the world and another configuration for another part of the world. So you can, yeah. you can really control uh, the, uh, uh, how, you, how your deployment is done globally. Right, it's very cool. Now, we're going to talk about Docker and, and yeah. the impact that that's had 
on, on this uh, uh, way that you can um, define microservices and deploy them. Yeah, and we're definitely gonna, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later. So this is our next session that we're gonna roll into. Um, and really what we wanna talk about here is the difference between you know, what a container is and what a microservice is, right? So we, we're here to talk about microservice architecture. Um, containers, they are actually ways to, to put your microservice into action, right? So you can actually have a container. Uh, think about it as a micro VM, right? Um, but it's not really a microservice. So if you actually took a container, um, and you could actually put a monolithic app into it, right? Um, so there's, you could still do that. So, uh, so part of the thing that we want to discuss here is, you know, what is the difference between, you know, deployment of containers, right, which is on a VM and, you know, you can script it and some of those things, um, and other services, right, like Service Fabric and App Services, where you can actually, those are containers as well, right? They're, they're we don't call them containers, but they are containers. They're isolated um, objects that you can actually go out and deploy to and scale up and down, right, from a microservice perspective. So, um, so I think, you know, one of the points that we wanted to really make was, uh, you know, that abstraction away from hardware, uh, right, which, which is what Docker gets you, which is what websites and app service and service fabric get you, is we don't worry so much about the infrastructure that we're running on or the actual physical hardware. We just care that our app is going to get into service and we're going to be able to run it um, and that it's going to be fault tolerant and it's going to be scalable um, and it's going to be responsive, right? Exactly. So there's some really good points there. So I wanted to just uh, close out and recommending uh, some reading material. And so uh, I have found these books uh, to be very helpful for me over the past year and getting my, my head around uh, this microservice space. You know, one is currently Eric Evans' Domain Driven Design. This right. book's been around a while, all right? Uh, it's, a, it's, uh, you know, one of the, it's, it's stood the test of time, as they say. Um, and it's all about domain-driven design. And, and so if you've got a copy of this, dust it off, reread you know, the, the first few chapters yeah. there where he you know, discusses domain-driven design. Certainly when he gets to the point where he talks about how to target a layered architecture, that's where you kind of may want to close the book <laughs> and say, well, we, we want to take it up through the you know, good practice, you know, good engineering practice around domain driven design. But now think about that as applied to microservices. But the, okay. s the techniques and skills that he that he goes through there are, are, are still applicable today. It's a so, great so maybe I shouldn't break out my decom book and <laughs> go after that. Well, you know, if I recall, those decom books were pretty thick and, and heavy, but could hurt yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, continuous delivery, uh, Jez Humble and David Farley. Uh, you really want to understand the concepts of de continuous delivery? Right. Um, great, great read there. And uh, they go into using uh, some tools that they like to use sort of in the second half of the book. But the first uh, half of the book is really more the concepts, uh, right. the ideas, and, and how you can uh, bring some of that uh, into your own bring some of those best practices into your own environment. Yeah, and I think that's a really important concept to, to keep in mind, right? So we're actually talking about, you know, microservices, and we're actually talking about the building of the software and some of those things, right? So, so as you go through and you start to build microservices, or you're just building an application in general, um, starting with the end in mind, right? Like, how am I going to get this thing in production uh, is super important. So, um, so, so taking a look at, at uh, books like this or, or, or literature like this and, and understanding, you know, what it means from a business perspective to come out, um, you know, as a software developer and say, cool, like as a business, we need to go and we need to be in production, uh, you know, every week, right, or twice a week um, will certainly determine how you build your app, right, and, and, and obviously forcing you more towards microservices, although you may not be all the way that way, right? right. I think microservices from a you know, how big is my app perspective is kind of loosely defined. Um, although, you know, we, we do say it has to be autonomous and things like that. So, so, so taking information like this from a continuous deployment and delivery model um, has a big impact on how we actually structure and architect uh, exactly. software. It's a great place to get started. Right. You know, if you're, if you're sort of in a, we don't, we, we're not doing this at all today. Right. DevOps is a great place to start. Continuous right. delivery. Um, you start to get your house in order there. Now you're really preparing yourself for more of a high velocity uh, development and deployment scenario. Right. And I, and I just think about that. Like you're thinking about the end game and how I'm going to get to from A to B, right? Uh, before you even start A. Exactly. Like, you know, how am I going to build my car? And, you know, it depends on which racetrack you're going to be <laughs> at, right? Now, I also like Lean Enterprise, and, and this is, again, Jez Humble with Joanne Molesky and Barry O'Reilly. This, this book kind of covers Lean uh, at an enterprise level, um, but there is a chapter on Lean Engineering. I think it's chapter eight. Again, you know, uh, the entire book is great. 
that chapter is fantastic for really understanding this idea of lean as applied to the software development life cycle and, and how, how that can be them, again, a set of methodology and skills that you could bring into your, into your team. And finally, uh, uh, on O'Reilly, Building Microservices from Sam Newman. Great book, really uh, stays at the, uh, the architectural level, kind of the concepts we talked about today, and it will reinforce a lot of the ideas that we discussed. Uh, it's a great book. Um, and I'm also happy to announce that I'll be, I am working on a book okay. on microservices uh, on Azure and for a press. And so uh, that's uh, in development and hopefully that will come out you know, sometime uh, this year. <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah, and so you know, a thing to keep in mind too, um, whenever you're going out and if you're looking for microservice architecture on the web and you know, you're looking for books, um, this is a, it is a forward thinking, right? So it's a, it's a thought leadership area right, right. now. So um, just like DevOps and some of the new things are being defined in that, um, as we're thinking about microservice architectures and, and you know, Microsoft just being a microservice platform with things like Service Fabric and App Services and things like that, um, you know, we're moving into that space. So, uh, so there's a lot of thought leadership happening um, that's going into books and literature. So there's always new stuff happening. Um, and, and, you know, possibly, you know, it, it takes developers like you watching to go out and figure out how to, you know, define, help us define like what microservices can be, right? So that's still total greenfield. Uh, in that space because it's it's pretty wide open right now. It is. It's a very exciting uh, uh, part of the industry right now, and uh, it is the time to learn and and figure out how you might evolve your own uh, skills, the the uh, skills of your team towards being able to do this. Everyone is adopting cloud platforms today. Everyone is moving to Azure. Right. You you need to really rethink your application architecture for right. that environment. And you know this is this is the recommended approach right now. But as we said, it, you know baby steps. What yeah. do you want to do first? Figure out how to do automation, continuous delivery. Do some analysis on your applications. Find you know find those seams and those those areas of capability. Possibly there's new functionality you want to build. Right. And then you know do do one. Do one microservice and, and get that experience and say, okay, we're, we're, we're going to figure out how to do it for, for ourselves. Right. And then I would make, also make a very good point. So if you do have you know, existing monolithic applications that you're running internally on you know, your own VMs and things like that, um, you know, all the things that we're talking about in microservices and Azure is sort of that you know, we can provide and support microservice architecture and deploying of microservices. Um, I would also say that you know, if you have monolithic apps or you have apps that are existing, um, especially websites, right, or, or any of the other um, stuff that's out there, um, you can deploy it to Azure today, right? So you can run VMs, um, you can run VMs that are elastic, right? So if you wanted to run your application and, and have multiple servers, have a server farm for web, uh, it's totally possible today without having to go to microservice architecture. Yes. Uh, so, so make sure you keep that in mind as well. So, so the microservices, we want to make sure like you have the opportunity to come back and, and re-architect and create a better DevOps motion and, and software, right? And building software faster uh, for you and your team. Uh, but we also want to make sure like we can support you today as well. So you can go ahead, take those applications, move them to the cloud um, so that you have resiliency and you have some of the um, some of the aspects of what the cloud provides, which is which is really great in today's, you know, having to keep your applications up and running, right? Absolutely. If you're if you're Moving in this direction, you know, foundational, we've got to bring cloud into our environment. We have to get comfortable with it. Right. Taking existing applications and moving, moving them to the cloud is a great way to learn Azure. Right. Make sure you automate that. Right. The PowerShell scripts to move, move that and to you know, spin up the VMs and deploy the software. Now you're learning how to do automation. Um, and then again, as you said, then the, there's the opportunity to re-architect and really take advantage of the of the platform as a service right. aspects in, in right. Azure. Right. And that might actually be really key, right? So if you're thinking about like, great, I'm gonna, you know, re-architect my monolithic app, if I get it into the cloud and then I am in actually in the same platform, right, where I can actually start to, you know, carve off slices, right, of this application and move them into microservices, right? They're all together on the same platform. They can communicate together, right? I'm not having to set up all these dependencies on, you know, uh, communication between the two, right? They can actually connect to each other. We can put them on the same networks and those sort of things, right? Exactly. So, so it totally makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, so Chris, what are we going to do after the break? So after the break, we're actually going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit about containers and microservices and what the differences are. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history and how to get there. Um, and then we're actually going to do a demo. So I'm going to show you how to get a VM up and running, how to put a container and deploy a microservice uh, in Azure. Uh, and it's going to be it's going to be great. Uh, it's going to be interesting because Bob's the third party person here. 
Uh, I'm the Microsoft guy, and I'm actually going to be doing uh, the Docker portion of this, the open source, uh, which should be fun. So hopefully I can uh, make that look seamless and look like I know what I'm doing. So, um, so what we're going to do uh, is we're going to take a quick 10-minute break, and we will be back, and uh, we'll get started on the session two of our MVA for um, microservice architecture using Docker and Microsoft Azure. Hi, welcome back to today's MVA session around microservice architecture uh, in Microsoft Azure. Um, myself and Bob Familiar are still here, um, so we're going to continue on with our next session. Um, in our session today, uh, we did cover <clears throat> module one, uh, which is uh, we, we covered a little bit of the background of microservice architecture and how we got here. Uh, we also have module two, which I'm going to talk about now, which is Docker and containers and, micro, and microservices. What, what's the difference between those? Um, and then we're going to cover, you know, uh, module three for Azure APIs, um, and then and then microservices for the Internet of Things. So we're going to continue on with that. Um, so we are on module two, two now. So we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, we did get some questions at break, so we're going to go ahead and cover a couple questions uh, that people had um, as part of uh, continuing here. Uh, so the first question that I want to cover, uh, someone asked, um, "How do you estimate time, cost, effort uh, to specify something as a microservice?" Um, so think of microservice, it is software development, right? So it's just a smaller bucket of, of software development. So all the same things around software development, architecture, and all the layers we talked about, and all the cost modeling, um, that all is exactly the same. Um, it just happens to be smaller in software development, right? So we're not planning for, you know, this huge application, we're just planning for a slice of it. Um, so take all the same things that you do from a software planning and cost estimating perspective, um, and use the same exact tools, right? You don't need to do anything different. Um, it's just a smaller slice of that. Um, although, you know, whenever you go into the deployment side of it, you might win a little bit, right? So, so it might be a little less painful. Right. <clears throat> there was another question on high availability. <clears throat> and certainly, if you think about how we're deploying these microservices uh, into, into Azure, uh, there are going to be, um, configure it so that there will be multiple instances. So certainly within, let's say, a region, the East region as an example, um, you could have uh, your microservices deployed there uh, and they're scaling up and down as needed. And if, you know, God forbid, something is wrong uh, in the East region, you know, the fact that we have all of this automated uh, we can, within a reasonable amount of time, spin up the same exact uh, instance, let's say, in the west, and and direct uh, all traffic there. So maybe you might place uh, your your uh, RESTful endpoints under something like Traffic Manager or an equivalent load balancer right. that can provide the disaster recovery. You know, saying, okay, now we're going to direct all traffic over to this other region. So you know, high availability is really kind of going to come from leveraging the cloud platform and the and the services it provides for scalability and fault tolerance. Right, and there's some really good things around DR too as well, right? So so thinking about like you can have two you know services running in different regions in Azure. You can actually have on-premise and Azure, you can actually do on-premise as the primary and you know Azure secondary, right? You can do both of those things. Um, we have some great tools around um, Azure Site Recovery and some of those tools, right, that you can use for DR, uh, coupled with some of the things like Traffic Manager that help you load balance whenever exactly. things fall out, right? Um, exactly. So there's some really good things that you can use uh, in Azure for that. Uh, and then the last question that I'm going to answer here um, is uh, Bob mentioned some architectural mapping tools. Um, I mentioned them as well. And, uh, and so I mentioned Visual Studio uh, only because I just remember there was the architectural diagram uh, tools in there. Um, and so uh, the question was, it was, you know, are they an ultimate? Uh, so they, they, they were an ultimate. Um, and if you're using Visual Studio 2013 and before it's still called ultimate, um, we did actually just release an enterprise version of Visual Studio. Um, so premium and ultimate have been combined. Um, so there's, they're in the enterprise edition if you're looking for those today. All right, so let's continue on. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, containers and microservices, right? What's the difference between those? Um, so in this module, we're going to we're going to go back a little bit. We're probably going to cover some of the same things that we talked about um, in the first presentation or the first module about um, you know DCOM and some of the things that we that happened right that got us to this point uh, from a container perspective. Um, and then we'll make a point about containers, right? So, so when we think about Docker and containers, or we think about Azure and, and microservices or services that it provides, right? So containerization on that side as well. All right, so we'll, we'll kind of cover that history. We're going to also discover a little bit about, you know, what inspired containers, right? So, so what does that really mean? Uh, we're also going to talk about what it means to deploy with containers. So we're going to actually see that 
Uh, and then we're going to make sure we clear up kind of, you know, what's the difference between containers and microservices? They're not the same thing, right? So we want to make sure we cover that um, and, and do that in depth because that's kind of the point of this module. One is to show you the Docker technology. Um, just because we have a really close partnership, you can run it in Azure. Um, so if you're running things that, that fit well in containers and you're doing that sort of thing today, um, there's lots of options. Containers happens to be one of them. Um, I'm actually going to be building a Node.js app. Um, I could very easily run that in an Azure website or app service uh, or service fabric, right? I could do all those things. Um, but I'm going to show you it in this just to show uh, for those of you on the phone or on the, on the um, session who, who do use Docker today to show you how to do that in Azure, right? All right. Cool. Let's get let's get over and, and talk about a little bit of the history of, of distributed applications, right? So, um, Bob mentioned this earlier. We had some some slides. I have some some images here that will help us maybe take a little bit better look at that. Um, but if you think about you know the past 10, 15 years, um, Bob mentioned that he's been doing this for a long time. Um, he's gotten gray hair from the projects. Um, my actually my hair would be gray if I had any. So, but. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but there you go. So all these things that we think about, um, from, from my perspective being a developer, from a developer background, um, you know, I did all these things, right? Like, like I've done open source technologies, I've done the Microsoft stack, I've done DCOM and message queuing and, and all these technologies that we had to put together. And so if I think back, you know, 10 years ago when I was building applications with DCOM, it was super painful, right? And, and, and just having, you know, like, great, I want to use, you know, this technology or that technology and trying to get those things to work together um, just didn't work all the time, right? Um, and then, you know, thinking about all those things that we used to use, right, and we still use today, right? Applications have not gotten any less complex. Um, so taking all those pieces that we use, um, that we use to compile an application and figuring out how to deploy them is not super easy, right? So thinking about, like, how do we do that, right? So if I had to write an automation script to go out and you know, in the demo I'm going to show you today to, you know, stand up a website and deploy that and stand up Redis Cache and stand up, you know, MongoDB and do all the things that I have to do and then go out and configure them. Um, it would take me a long time. But instead, what I'm going to end up with is, you know, I can write two lines of scripts and we can do a deployment, right? It's super duper easy. Um, uh, you can also do that in Azure. So if you're doing that with Azure websites where you actually have code or using Visual Studio Online and you want to deploy to a website, um, there's already built-in functionality where you can go in and create a build that actually deploys directly to uh, an Azure website. Um, it can put it into staging and then there's some great functionality to go out and you know do some automation with, swip, with swapping, right? So you can swap your staging and production environments if you need to, right? To, uh, to move those things into production, which is really great. So there's a lot of good functionality, um, not only in what I'm going to show you in this, in this uh, module, but also in the other modules we're going to see with Bob. So, All right, let's move on here. Um, so if we think about managing and deploying those distributed applications, right, like what do I need and, and you know, where am I going to deploy this thing? What does my target look like, right? So you'll notice all the things on the bottom. They're all hardware based, right? So when we think about when we used to deploy our distributed applications, we're like, oh, is it going to be on an x86 architecture? Is it going to be on a, you know, maybe it's going to be on a mainframe or maybe, it's, you know, where's it going to land? I have no idea, right? So, so we always had to consider that, right? Whenever we were working with applications, um, primarily when you were working cross-platform back then, right? You didn't have all the components in, in all the places, right? That you needed to have. Um, so you, ha you had to really think about that. So then there became this matrix of how do I lay this out? Um, so if you think about some of the um, methodologies that had gotten brought out before Agile, right, like ITIL and some of those things, right, that, that really went around managing these sort of monolithic, like distributed applications, um, they were put in place for a very good reason. And we figured out a lot of things during that process to move us where we are today. Uh, but if you went back to the matrix that you had to build to go and deploy an application, especially if you had multiple teams and big teams at that with big applications, uh, it was not easy. It was it was it was pretty difficult. So, um, so having that you know applications not getting any less complex, um, but the abstraction from hardware right into containers and services that we can run becomes pretty easy. It really flattens out this this notion of a matrix. That's a <clears throat> that's a very key point. I know we over the break we received some questions on service oriented architecture, and I think th that is the point there that they were asking for some you know comparison to microservices and so on uh, right. and. At the end of the day, microservices and leveraging cloud platforms, it's very similar, mm 
Right. It's a lot easier. And I think it's, it's abstracting what we want to do away from the hardware. If you were doing service-oriented architecture 10, 12 years ago and you know, beginning to do that, uh, defining WSDL and discovery services and right. you know, s adopting SOAP, um, it was still fairly heavyweight and you had to actually understand uh, from the hardware level up what you were deploying your, your software into. Right. And now we can actually be abstracted from all of that and think more uh, about the services themselves, the capabilities they need at runtime, and deploying in them into an environment that provides right. provides the love and care that they need, <laughs> right. uh, and the scalability that they need, and and that's that's a key point. Right. Yeah, and I think it's a really good point too. So you know, so architecture when it first came out, and then it kind of evolved, right? And so it really took technology to catch up to that, right? To have things like Wizdle and and some automation behind that from a software development perspective, um, we really made a lot of ground in that. Um, so if you're still doing those things today, there's some really great tools out there, right? It's still so prevalent um, in the enterprise, right? Um, sometimes, you know, it might be needed, right? You might need transactional support or something that you might need from a SOA architecture, right? Um, so, so definitely having that. But if you're building those and moving those into microservices, and then you can start to say, like, great, everything doesn't have to be a SOA app, right? I don't have to have transactions and everything. Uh, so if you start to build those microservices, you can split them up, and some can be yeah. just you know, lightweight services. And, and some could be cloud services. Right. And which some, will, which yeah. will provide those, you know, the capabilities you need, let's say, through through the WCF. Right. Definitely. And you can mix and match, right? So, yes. so you know, we talked about those services, so they could be WCF, they could be anything, right? Right. Exactly. As long as they're providing, you know, that, that, that uh, definition of microservice, right? Autonomous and scalable and those sort of things. Exactly. All right. So, so what was the inspiration for containers? Um, so I'm going to go into this a little bit. It's going to make sense. Maybe some of you have already seen this slide. Um, it's just a really great way to think about it. Uh, so, so think about cargo transport. Um, you know, pre 1960s, right? Um, so if I wanted to ship, uh, you know, barrels, or I wanted to ship livestock, or I want to ship pianos, or desks, or whatever it might be, right? Or barrels, right? Or maybe I want to ship a bag of beans, right? Like, like it. it it became really difficult if you think about you know some of the old pictures that you saw where you know they're mo removing stuff from ships, right? They didn't have any real way to do that, right? Yeah, they, everything was in like a big net, right? right. With some yeah, just throw it all in, canvas and, bag thrown over it, right? And so you think about like what does that take? So if you look on the bottom there and the, and you know what it takes to get there, like how do I ship that? Like I got to have so many tools to go off and figure out how to get that off a ship, right? Like I got to go out and do all these things to get it from point A to point B, right. right? And so when we think about software development, we really think about, you know, hey, we're going to build it, we're going to get it from point A where we're building it, and we're going to get it into production in point B. So how do we do that, and how do we, how do we wrap that up into some, you know, I'm going to say container here, but how do we wrap that up into some process where we can, like, easily deploy it, where we can do it over and over again repeatedly so that we can lower the cost and the effort that we need to go and deploy these services, right, microservices. Um, and this also, it pertains to, to um, monolithic apps too, right? So how do we, you know, reduce dependencies and how do we make it fit into this box so that we can easily deploy it and automate it? Um, so it's kind of what containers, right, and when we talk about that, right, so this is pre-1960, so shipping cargo, well, you know, whether it's by boat or ship or whatever it might be, uh, train. Um, and then moving into the intermodal shipping containers, right? So we have containers, right? Right. So now, if you see all the ships out in the harbor, right, they don't have loosely coupled stuff, right? Everything's packed in a container. So basically, if you can get it to a container, you can ship it anywhere, right? Um, so if you want to put, you know, twenty container, you know, twenty pianos in a container, or you want to put, you know, five cars, or, you know, you want to put a whole bunch of servers in a container, you can ship them, right? As long as they fit. Um, and the really important thing here, right, is that it became a low barrier of entry for the shipping system. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means to them and, and the cost and effort and things around that. Uh, but at this point, right, we have containers. We can actually put stuff in it. Um, and if you ever see the trucks on the road, right, uh, in the U.S., they have containers. Um, and anywhere on the world, in the in the world, right. So if you see trucks with containers, the containers are all the same size. The trailers all take the same containers, right? They put them on trains. They stack them too high, right? Um, they store them, they stack them. Um, it becomes really easy to do that, right? So we gain a lot of efficiencies um, in this sort of scenario, but from a software development perspective, if you think about it in that scenario, um, all the things that we need in our application, we start to put in containers, right? And then we can ship the container. Um, and that's really important from, and, and I really think, you know, that's what Docker's trying to solve, but I think there's a lot of things in Azure that solve that same problem, right? So when we think about, you know, deploying, uh, 
a website, right? So, um, you know, once we get it into a packaging system and we move it, we can just move it and deploy it to Azure. We just tell Azure, like, hey, here's our website and, you know, go make 500 of these, right? It'll do exactly the same thing. Um, so it becomes a little bit easier to deploy uh, and it's very scriptable, right, at that point. So it's, it's easy to automate and move, um, just like containers, right? All right, so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what happened whenever intermodal shipping uh, happened with containers. Um, so 90% so of all cargo is now shipped in containers, right, which makes sense because it's easy if, if it's a container. Containers are pretty big, right? They can put, you know, you can put a multitude of things in it. Um, it lowered the cost dramatically, right? So um, there's some really good statistics there on the fourth line um, that say the reduction in, in cost, right? So it went from greater than 25% of what it costs to ship goods uh, to less than 3%. Um, so if you think about that from a software development perspective, you know, is it going to cost you any less to develop software? Um, you know, if you're using monolithic and using those, it's going to cost you the same as it costs you today. Um, you know, from a, from a what you'll get done perspective in a microservice architecture, you might move a little faster, you might actually move a lot faster, who knows, right? Uh, but you'll have some cost savings there. But I think a lot of the cost, right, whenever we think about it from a, from a container packaging run and deploy perspective um, comes whenever we start moving those things into production. Um, so, so there's a couple things. There's the actual like manpower to move it. Um, and then there's the other side of that, which is the opportunity cost for us, right? So think about it from a business perspective. If I'm going out and I can deploy every six months and that's, that's really all I can do because I have to test and I'm really set up in this process and deployment of my development, um, I lose an opportunity to get production to production and, and have these features for my users, right? So I'm losing out um, if somebody else is going to beat me in market, right? So I need to make sure that I take that into account. Um, so, so leaning towards some of the methodologies that we're talking about in architectures um, will let you, you know, reduce that time to market, um, which is actually going to reduce, you know, the footprint that you have to use to automate to get to production, uh, but also reduce that opportunity cost for you too, right? Exactly. Velocity is key, right? And that's what we're trying to achieve here. Right. By uh, reducing the surface area of each of the various pieces of software that, that we're building, mm -hmm. um, getting standardized ways that we, that we um, uh, place them into containers and deploy them right. into the runtime environments, um, gives us the ability now to go to the business and say, we can deliver uh, that functionality, that feature, you know, uh, you know, new features, let's say weekly or every month, or you're now at a much higher velocity than you would be in a traditional monolithic development lifecycle. Right. Great. So now let's let's think about a little bit too. Let's talk a little bit about deploying using containers. Um, so in this uh, in this section here, let's go the other way. Uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about is those containers, right? So we 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 saw earlier when we had our matrix of, you know. DCOM and all the other things that we might have and, and um, not being inside of a container, um, you know, we had question marks, like how do we maintain all the integrity across applications and environments and the deployments that we might do. Um, so we're going to be able to eliminate that matrix, right? So, so in this actual example, I'm going to show you how to do a, a Docker container where you actually put everything inside of the container. You can save it, you can export it, um, you can export it to another machine and just have it up and running, uh, which is great, um, especially if you're using that development model and you're, you know, you're, you're on that platform, right? So Docker is a Linux platform. Uh, so, so if you're on that platform and you're using containers, um, it's a really great option. This option is also available for .NET developers who are doing things like, hey, I want to go package a website. So, so if you've used cloud services before, there's a packaging system which puts all your, your app into a single file. Uh, so think about that as a container, right? So that's a container. It gets shipped. You upload it to Azure and you say, great, now I'll create 20 of these, right? Um, and I think that's super highly automated uh, from that perspective, right? So if you think about it from that and, you know, you know the containerization, right? And, and really what I'm trying to say I, I guess is, is really, I guess my next point here is that, um, you know, what's the difference between containers and microservices, right? It's super important for us to decide and, and discuss, you know, containers are not, they're not microservices, right? We can actually put a monolithic app inside of a container, right? And we can run, right? Let us run a monolithic app, right? It doesn't really constitute a microservice um, with that. So, and we could do the same thing in software development when we're deploying to Azure, right? I can deploy a monolithic app to a VM or a website. Uh, but I could also slice it up and make a microservice architecture. Right. All right, and then I'm going to just skip back one here just to talk a little bit about what how Docker treats, uh, creates and maintains containers. 
Um, so we actually have here, um, you can see on the, on the left, we're actually doing an abstraction there away from hypervisor, guest OS, this is VMs. Um, and then on the right side, we see containers. So we have the host, o, uh, the host OS, uh, we have the, the, the Docker daemon running, um, and then we actually have the apps, right? So we have uh, bins and libs here, um, right here. So we have app and app A running, right? So we can have multiple services running in a container. Um, and then you can see on the, on the right there, we actually have a bigger container running, um, which, which could be the case, right? Uh, so I'm going to show you one today, and we're going to actually use multiple containers and some of those things. So, uh, so there is a, a lot less overhead. We can actually ship those containers. They are portable. Um, and we can also do that in Azure, right, by packaging up our code and then having Azure websites deploy it as well, right? Um, and that's a really good point, right? I think about, you know, app services and service fabric. And, you know, once you do your first deployment into that, right, it has the packaging system. It's already built. You just say, great, I need, you know, 500 of these. Um, and you're not, you're not creating new VMs, right? You're not creating new containers. You're just saying, great, give me 500 and it's going to go create 500. So it's a super elastic uh, way to look at deploying. Exactly. Right. All right, so let's take a little bit of a look here. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about this before we get into the demo, right? I have Docker containers on the bottom. Um, I actually have Azure on the top. So if we think about microservices um, in that aspect and, and really take out the container part of it, um, really, I, you know, on the bottom, I just run a ASP.NET Core, ASP.NET website, right? Or I run a, run a Node.js website. Um, I can also do that um, in Azure web, web apps, right? I can just go into app services or service fabric. I can run a website, um, and I can run Node.js, right? I can run PHP, I can run Java websites, um, and I get the same sort of elastic architecture that I would in Docker, um, and, and almost the same from an automation perspective, right, uh, on how I deploy that. Uh, same thing for mobile apps or API apps or logic apps, right? Uh, so I have all the containers for those. Um, I can also put containers, right, in Docker and do the same thing if I were using that platform. Uh, but I can also get to that sort of mechanism in Azure directly today, right? I don't need the container service to have elasticity uh, and, and ease of automation, right? Which is really, I guess, our point around microservice architecture is that it has to be automated, scalable, and autonomous, right? Exactly. You want you want to be able to you know, take that the the some business capability, define the data contract, the API. Um, you want to be able to you know code that, test it, right. package it up, and automate the deployment into you know a staging environment, into a production environment, right. and you know how what container you deliver that into uh, is. It's very flexible, right? Right, and you're going to put it into the container that's going to provide the the runtime services that your particular microservice needs. Right, um, and and the fact that these you know the cloud platform gives you such, you know, Azure gives you such great flexibility uh, to say, yeah, we're going to do it into a VM environment, an infrastructure as a service approach. We're going to do it into a platform as a service approach. Right, either is is viable. Either is is uh, uh, you know fairly straightforward to do. It provides the elasticity. Uh, and the security requirements that you need. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, and again, going back to what's, how does this compare to, to SOA? You know, I can remember working on, you know, SOA-oriented projects you know, in the past, and it just, you know, it didn't have the simplicity, it didn't have the elegance uh, that we are able to essentially achieve what we are trying to achieve with SOA, but doing it uh, leveraging uh, cloud plaf uh, you know, cloud platforms like Azure gives us this uh, uh, much more straightforward way right. to package up the services that, that make up our solution and, and put it into an environment that provides all, everything it needs. Yeah, and I think you made a really good point there, right? So, so when we think about you know, Docker containers and Azure, right, we're really talking about a platform, right? So we saw that Docker containers, they're abstracted away from the OS, right? They're abstracted away from the hardware. Right. Um, such as so are the uh, you know the Azure services that are running out there, right? So web apps and mobile apps. You don't and think about apps. servers anymore, right? You know, why, yeah, right. We, we don't, don't have need to. virtual machines, yeah, right? And, and in some cases, you know, when you get to the platform as a service, you don't even think about virtual machines anymore. You're right. thinking about, you know, I, I need so much elasticity. I need a right. certain you know size of instance, and and you know, provide that for me, and and here are the ranges in which you know I'm happy for this thing to execute within, and Azure take care of the rest. Right. Very good point. All right, now comes the fun. So now I'm going to get into the demo. I'm going to cross my fingers that all my demo stuff works here. Um, and so what we're going to do here, uh, I'm going to go ahead, open up my virtual machine. And uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm in the Azure portal here, uh, as you can see. Uh, I already have a, a Docker machine running, so I thought I'd get this all prepped. We, we only have you know, 75 minutes here to do this. So, um, so what I have is I have a, a, a Docker machine running out there. 
Um, you can see that I'm running it. It's a, it's a Linux. This is Ubuntu 14.1 uh, or 14.10. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to be doing a lot of stuff on the console. So you, those of you who are .NET developers and are used to a lot of UI, it um, might be a little painful, right? But, uh, but we're going to go through it um, and just uh, we're going to have a little fun here. Uh, so this machine is running out there. Uh, I'm actually using a D3 machine with four cores and 14 gigs, so I could actually host a lot of containers on this machine um, if I needed to. And uh, I'm going to go ahead here, take a look at the endpoints. Um, so I already have a, an SSH tunnel open, so I'm going to be able to SSH into this, which is the command line I'm talking about. So I'm actually going to get on the, uh, the Linux command line over SSH. Uh, we're going to do a lot of things in there. We're also going to take a look at the app. Um, and our app here is going to be patient detail. So this is going to be the first app um, in our overall application. Um, it's not going to be as integrated as we wanted to, but it's actually going to it's actually going to become one of the services, right, in our .NET or, or I shouldn't say .NET, our cross-platform API, right, that we're going to expose for the application that you That's saw right. in the beginning. That's right. All right, and then I have that running on a, a public port here, and then I have, I'm doing a Node.js app, so I'm going to run this on 3000 internally, so it's going to do a port mapping for me um, so that we can just call it on the regular um, HTTP traffic without having to put in a colon and, and uh, port number. All right, so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, application first. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. Uh, so this is Visual Studio Code. Um, this is an open source cross-platform um, code editor, so if you're using Mac or Linux, um, you can use this code editor. Um, I just chose it here because I'm using Node.js. It's a lightweight editor for me. Um, it's going to provide all the things that we need today. Um, I can very easily open this up in you know, Visual Studio, um, Enterprise, or, or Pro, or Community, or Sublime Text, right? It's just a text editor for me. Uh, but I'm going to go in here. We're going to talk a little bit about this. So, um, and so this is a Node.js app. Um, so what I have here is a server, uh, a server.js file. This is sort of our bootstrap here. Um, and then we actually have uh, our apps defined. We're going to be using Express um, mean stack. And um, I'm going to increase my font here a little bit, I hope. All right. We're going to use Zoom it here. Perfect. There we go. If I can control my mouse here. Uh, so we have Express in here. We have an app. Um, we're going to be using a mean stack today, so we're going to be using Mongo Express. Um, we won't have the Angular piece of mean in there, but we're actually going to use Node.js. Um, and very much um, like like a .NET app or some of the the uh, slides that the Bob threw up earlier, I actually do have um, this kind of broken down into an architecture that's going to be composable, right? Um, so if I think about this, what I have here um, on this side is I actually have um, a plugin model. So I built a plugin model where I can actually load up plugins. Um, I'm actually going to load up the database so I don't make direct calls to it. So I have my data access layer. Um, I actually do have a models layer. So here's my patient definition, right? So I have patient information, doctor information, insurance information. Uh, I'm going to be able to use that actually not only just in my application, but that's what I'm going to transfer on the wire. So it's going to be my model contract, which is kind of cool. Um, and you can see here that I have Express Mongoose, and then I actually use underscore in here um, to actually do the data transfer between you know incoming objects and my my actual um, data models that I have. Um, so the code is probably not going to be perfect, so don't judge me on my code. Uh, I'm not a Node.js developer by day, so uh, I did this in a few hours, put it all together, um, and uh, and did that. So all right, perfect. So in our server here, you can see that we're actually going to um, open up. Uh, this, we're going to actually have our plugin, we're going to connect to our database, uh, and then we're going to wire up our API. So you saw our API there, we're going to make slash API, and then we're actually going to put it up in all of our routes. Um, so if we look at our patient routes here, we're actually going to have, um, we're going to have our, our uh, patient route here for uh, patient, we have patient by ID, and then we actually have an uh, initiation um, function there as well. So that's going to give us the ability to, uh, to go out and, and populate and hydrate our database. So if you're doing this from an automation perspective, there might already be a database existing. Uh, you might also use this if you're using test data uh, in this example. So all I'm doing is actually going out, uh, reading a JSON file here that has all my data in it, and hydrating my MongoDB database. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so let's get to it. Um, so this is actually stored uh, in Visual Studio Online. Uh, and I have that here. I'll open up a new tab. Um, so we have our code up here. Uh, so I'm actually just going to be able to go out and do a git clone whenever we set, stand up our Docker VM, and we're going to be able to connect to it directly. 
So I'm going to go in just to see that our code's here. I'm going to actually need the URL in a second anyway, so I'm going to bring it up while we're here. And there we go. So there's all of our uh, Node.js app. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so what I've done is I've gone ahead and connected over SSH. Right, That's the protocol to connect to Linux um, uh, whenever you're doing remote terminal. So I'm going to go ahead here. Uh, the first thing I want to do, I have Docker installed. Um, I actually want to show you the Docker images that I'm going to be using today. So um, I'm going to actually show you images, so sudo docker images. Uh, it's going to give me all the images that I have. Uh, so I have the base Ubuntu image, I have a, uh, a MongoDB. I actually have a Python, so Python is going to be our base for our Node.js app. So we actually have Node.js installed here in our image. Um, so we're going to be using those containers uh, with the applications already pre-installed. So, so what that means is that the container already has Mongo database in it, right? It already has the MongoDB executables. All we have to really do is create a container out of that image, uh, give it a name, and it's going to take off and go run. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, write that up. So we're going to run this. We're actually going to run this as a, uh, as a daemon, so we're going to run it in the background. Um, I'm actually going to bring up another, uh, the Node.js one in the foreground, so we're actually going to interact with it directly. Uh, but what we're going to do is run this in the background. Uh, and as you'd expect, I'm going to need some ports defined, right? So, so MongoDB is 27.0.17, right, for the, for the actual database ports, so I need to put that in here, right? What, what am I going to expose? So it's going to expose it on the local host so that I can connect to it. Um, I actually want this thing to, uh, to restart. Um, if the machine restarts or if it fails or something like that. Uh, always. So I'm going to actually put that in. Uh, I'm going to give this thing a name. It's going to be very important for the name whenever we get into it because what's going to happen is, um, is the name is going to be the way that we're going to actually link our Node.js container back to our MongoDB so that it can have data access back to MongoDB, which is really cool. All right, so there we go. We have our name, restart. Um, so now we need to specify the image we're going to use. So we're going to use the Docker file, MongoDB. And then we're going to say what process we want to run, right? So this is going to be the place where we define our process that we want to have. Um, and we're going to run the MongoD process, MongoD, just like that. So as soon as I hit Enter, it's going to run a container. It's going to give us this long number back. Um, so what we can do is go ahead and uh, we're going to use the PS minus A, which is actually going to show us all of the Docker containers that are running. And you can see there, we actually have a container called MongoDB. Uh, it's running the man with the command MongoD. Uh, it's using this, the latest Docker file. It's been up and running for 12 seconds, right? So it's already instantiated. It's a whole MongoDB in a container all by itself, right? It's pretty cool. All right. And so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use a, a tool that I use quite often to connect to MongoDB. I'm going to use um, uh, RoboMongo here. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this. So you can see I'm actually going to connect to localhost 27017. Um, this is a remote Azure. Uh, so what I've done is I've said connect over SSH, right? Use my Azure username password so I'm able to connect to MongoDB. And I'm going to hit connect. I'm going to cross my fingers and hopefully that shouldn't happen. but. Um, Let's try it one more time here. Hopefully I specified the right port. All right. Let me try that one more time. And if it doesn't, we'll go ahead and hydrate our database and, and uh, we should be good. All right. That didn't work, so it's not the end of the world. So let's go ahead um, and let's move back towards uh, getting our other database up and running. All right. So, so now that we have our MongoDB in place, let's go ahead and get a, a Node.js uh, Container up and running. So what we're going to do is this Node.js container doesn't have uh, doesn't have our app in it yet, right? So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to go ahead and create a, a, a Node.js container, uh, and I'm going to call it App Setup. And then what we're going to do is we're going to instantiate our application installed, and then we're actually going to save that off so that we can redeploy it with all the things and bits installed that we need in it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a a Docker run here. And I'm going to make an interactive session by doing int instead of d for, for, for daemon there. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this a port name. Actually, P, we're going to say 3000 because that's the port that Mongo or, or Node.js is going to be on. And what we're going to go ahead to and do is we're going to go ahead and link this up. Um, and we're going to link it to MongoDB. So what this is going to allow us to do is going to allow our application to go ahead and talk to the MongoDB container. So this Node.js app uh, and the MongoDB container can talk on the 27.0.17 port uh, to each other um, on, on the Docker um, 
mechanism, right? So, so they don't have to go out. Um, very easily, this MongoDB could actually be on a different server. Maybe you're you know, doing it on the same network. Um, that's OK, but since they're on the same machine, I'm actually going to link them together and make it easier for them to communicate and process. All right, and then I'm going to give it a name here. And so we're going to call this App Setup. Uh, we're actually going to name our, our final Docker container. We're going we're to name it Patient Detail here at the end. All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and use a Docker file, and we're going to use um, Node.js. And what we're going to do is go ahead and hit Enter here, and it's going to go ahead and create that. Let me just make sure I got everything right here. I think I'm good. And what's going to happen, it's going to go ahead and create MongoDB. Let's see. Let's see why this didn't work. MongoDB, MongoDB, is that right? All right, hopefully this works. That should work. All right, let's see here. I think there was someone, oops, making it worse. All right. Oh, I see. Sorry. Someone, I think someone mentioned that on the chat, so thank you very much. Um, I forgot the O there in the MongoDB. That helps a little bit, right? So, all right. So I'm actually going to go ahead. Um, I actually it deployed this container without it. So I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, stop that container and redeploy it so that we can connect to it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just say, and I'm going to stop that one. And we're going to call this um, app setup. And we're going to go ahead and just remove that. So that's pretty easy. You just stop and you do rm for a container. And now if we look, it's gone, right? So it's that easy, right? That's simple just to create and add new containers. All right. And this is the right one. So we're going to go ahead and create this. It's going to go ahead and create that. And you can see it's giving me a new prompt there. So it's giving me the container right name as part of the prompt. Um, so what we're going to go ahead and do here, right? we're on the data. That's our root directory here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and do a git clone here. It has the git tools in it. We're going to do a git clone. And uh, what I'm going to do is go back over to our patient detail. And I'm actually going to copy this URL, put it into here, and I'm going to paste it. And I'm actually going to put this in a slash data directory, so we have that right mechanism. And there we go. So it's going to be cloning that. I'm going to put in my name here and uh, my super secret password. I always say super secret, so if so if I don't get them right, I can say it's so Ooh. secret I forgot it, right? Uh, but it looks like it's going to go ahead and connect here. Uh, it's connecting to Visual Studio Online. Uh, and it brought that down. So now we're in there. So if I go ahead and do a uh, command there, I can see that I have API live modules in my server.js, right? Super straightforward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this. So I'm going to go ahead and run. So Node's already installed here. Um, I should also note that uh, in, in my packaging system, I actually have all of the packages that I have dependencies on. So as soon as Node starts up, uh, MPN is going to go ahead and bring those all down and install them for us, which is going to be good. I'm going to go ahead and run this in case anything happens that I don't know about. There we go. So node's running. Uh, it's running there uh, on port 3000. We've went ahead and defined that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and bring up a new tab here. And uh, we have the MVA-Docker Cloud App. And I'm going to go ahead and initialize the data. Cross my finger. There we go. So we're all initialized. Uh, and so if we look back over here, I actually did a console write out for the patient numbers, right? So that we'd have an incremental number. Um, and there's all our patients. So now if we were to run this um, and go back to our API uh, and do patient here, cross my fingers, we see all the JSON data for all the patients that we just hydrated our database with. Um, and now we can actually do patient. And uh, you know, if we're looking for patient one, we can just put it in and we'll just get back that occurrence of it. Uh, which is really cool. So it's really easy to set that up, right? We went in, we just create a container, we deploy it, um, we actually put our app into it so that we got a little bit left to do, uh, which we're going to do now, and then we're actually going to come back um, and then show how we actually take that then um, and put it into the instance of a bigger application.
All right, so let me close this. Uh, we have that. Very cool. So I'm going to go ahead and just stop this. Uh, we're going to be back at our command prompt there. Um, and what's going to happen now is we can actually just exit out of this. And if we go back into Docker now, and there we are. We can see our Node.js application. We can see that it exited four seconds ago. So we actually hit the exit command. So the actual process is not running for that container. Um, if I wanted to start it, I could just say sudo start or docker start. And, uh, and we could actually just put in um, app setup. Right? And it would actually run it. So now if we look at that command, um, it's back up and running again. Right? So it's super simple to get them up and running. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to go ahead and stop this one. So it'll put it into the stop state. And so what we're actually going to do now is we're actually going to go out and we're actually going to commit this. And so what this is going to do, if I spell it right, is it's actually going to go uh, and take this app setup VM or, or container that we've put all of our code into, and it's going to allow us to create a new image, right? So we're going to create a new image with all of our things installed. So if I want to, you know, go and deploy 100 of these containers, I can just, you know, script them, right? Um, it'll have all the bits and pieces that I need um, with the linking that I need to run it. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to name this Node.js patient detail, just like that. Hit enter. And so what we have is it's committed to the repository. So if you remember, we did images earlier, and we had the Ubuntu image, and MongoDB, and Node.js, and Python. Um, we should have a new image there now. So if I do that, oh, we want to have images, not the, there we go. Let me do images. There we go. And so at the top there, we have our Node.js app uh, with our patient detail, right? So, so that's just a, it's an incremental add-on to the Node.js uh, Docker file that we have as our base, right? Um, and so if we look at the history on that, what we see is that we have Node.js patient detail, and then it goes Node.js uh, Dockerfile, Node.js, Dockerfile Python, and then Dockerfile Ubuntu, right? It's the base, right? So there's a hierarchical structure to the, to the actual layering that you use um, whenever you build containers, right? So this container um, is, is there, and we have all the bits and pieces that we need to go ahead and deploy that. So it's really cool technology. So, yeah. And, uh, and so think about that technology as compared to like an Azure website or an Azure app service or an Azure service fabric deployment, right? Um, what we're seeing is that we actually still had to package up the app just like we would package anything, right? We just cloned it. Um, so if we're doing that, you know, from a, a, a website in, 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 uh, in Azure, we can actually go and say, cool, great, go do the Git clone, right? So we already have a mechanism built in to pull that. Um, it can actually do the containerization. Um, and just like I said, now that I have a container for this, so when you spin up that first website image in, in Azure, it, it is the image, right? So now if I want 500 of those, I just go in the console and type in 500, or on the API and say I want 500 of these, right? I get 500, right? So, uh, so I, I think myself, personally, it's a little more elastic, right, than containers, because if I want to do this container, I could put, you know, 200 on this machine. If I want to go and do that on another machine, right, I need to go and add 200 commands on the other machine, right? Where if I'm doing this in Azure and doing it on Azure websites or Azure uh, app service or service fabric, you know, I'm still kind of, you know, I'm still dependent on VMs here, where in the other services I'm not, right? I still get the kind of ease of deployment, uh, but I still have the ability from a microservice perspective to go and scale that out. And I don't really have, I don't really need to know how many VMs, right? You know, it could be 50, it could be 100, it could be two. You know, as long as I get what I need from the service, it's all, it's all I really care about, right? Right, and what you've demonstrated is you can achieve reuse certainly at the, at the code level. So every developer group I talk to, they're very concerned about that. You know, does microservices mean we, we don't share our code anymore? It's like, no, there's, you can share your code. Right. At the end of the day, it's how are you packaging it and how are you deploying it? Right. <clears throat> and that's where you, know, you want to be able to have all the pieces that you need in, in sort of um, uh, independent autonomous projects, right. files, pull them together, and script the deployment into, into the appropriate container. Right, and that's a, that's a really good point. And, and sort of the point that I was trying to make earlier was that um, with my slides was, was you know, 
I think a lot of times that um, when people think about Docker and containers, right, and, and microservices, they get them mixed up, right? So, so, so the containers, they can, they can host microservices, but they're not microservices, right? They are containers that are for deployment, right? So if we think about them as the automation from a deployment perspective, um, I think about that, right? I think about what those are, right? And think about things like Chef and Puppet and some of those other automation tools. Um, and the automation tools that we have in Azure, right? They're just a way to get these things into a continuous deployment or ease of deployment, right? To lower that barrier uh, that we have to get to production. Right, and so, so this is a way to do that. There's also other ways, right, if you're not on Linux as a platform, right? So Azure is going to provide you a lot of those capabilities, you know, out of the box with the standard services that we have for hosting, you know, both microservices and, and um, monolithic apps, right? Right, and, and, you know, if you're using Visual Studio uh, to, to uh, uh, define your so solutions and your projects for, uh, uh, for Azure, you'll find that the PowerShell scripts Right. Are, are generated for you. So, you know, learning how those function, how they're used, be able to um, leverage those outside the context of Visual Studio right. in more of a, a scripted automation uh, for deploying uh, your, your uh, microservices is key. Right, and I, and, I, and I think about that too from a developer's perspective today, and maybe this is an impromptu question to you. You know, when we think about developers, and, and, uh, and I got posed this question uh, whenever I did a keynote at VS Live uh, a couple years ago, um, you know, what does it mean to be a modern developer these days? So when you're building modern apps, which is really what we're talking about, we're talking about building modern microservices and modern architectures to support, you know, and modern not being like, hey, it's a Windows 8 or JavaScript app, right, or a Windows Store app or, a, you know, Android or iPhone app, right? It's, it's not really what it's about. It's about how are we going to evolve our architectures and, and move into a model where it's, it's easier for us to build and deploy, right? And so thinking about that, you know, what does it mean to be a, a modern developer? Like, what kind of skills do you think that developers need these days, right? You talked a little bit about PowerShell, right, right. and automation. So, you know, what kind of skills do you think they need, right, to... to to be relevant and, and really to take command of, of you know, deploying in, in a fast-paced environment. Right, so it, it, it kind of stretches across a, a number of topics. Certainly, you know, uh, when I look at um, uh, the folks on my team, uh, the, the cloud and services team at Blue Metal, uh, you, you, you know, they're, they're on that team because first and foremost, they have experience as architects and um, are very experience in applying methodology and process to, to what they do. So bringing the right methodology and process, uh, and in our case, it's, uh, it's uh, always very much a lean engineering uh, and an agile principles with a uh, you know, scrum development process uh, and forming teams that, that have all the skills that you need right. uh, to, to deliver the software. Now, when you get into you know, the kinds of modern solutions, whether they're, you know, we're doing a lot of uh, work in the area of Internet of Things, um, in, uh, in, in helping organizations get to Azure with, uh, you know, what is uh, usually referred to as a lift and shift. So taking existing monolithic apps, how can we just get them uh, to run within an infrastructure as a service? Right. Or we're, we're, we're helping them take existing um, uh, web-based applications and, and get them running within uh, Azure websites. But then with an eye always towards Rearchitecting for for microservices. So it's interesting to see that the, the uh, I've got certainly folks who are expert in in the various technology stacks, going from you know user experience, uh, uh, JavaScript libraries for responsive design, through um, design and development of of uh, APIs, uh, to to you know experts in you know, da designing data access tiers using enterprise library or, um, and certainly leveraging technologies like Redis Cache and Document DB. So they have, you know, sort of those, those right. skills you would expect on this particular technologies. Yeah. But I also have a couple members of my team who, you know, one is a, one's a developer and one is a IT pro. And they're both um, focused now on DevOps. And what's interesting is to see the, for example, the IT pro uh, uh, gentleman learning to be essentially a developer. I, I think it's cool you know, and, uh, uh, to see, you know, as I told him, I told him, you know, you know I, going back a year, I said, you know, you're, you're really focused on networks and server configurations and, and system administration, things of that sort. But I said, you know, uh, as, we, as we do more and more of these cloud engagements, you know, you're going to be a developer. Right. And uh, he didn't believe me at first. 
And now on every engagement, he's writing, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of lines of, you know, PowerShell uh, to, to manage these, these uh, cloud environments. So right. he's become a developer. He's learned how to use, uh, you know, source code control systems. You know, you learn how to use Git and Visual Studio Online and, right. um, you know, and, and, and so on. And then the, the, I also have a, a developer on the team and knows how to do development, full stack development, but uh, is also in the same way, skilled up to do DevOps. And so it's interesting to see sort of the developer perspective on DevOps and the IT pro perspective on DevOps and how they're, they're actually, they've come together. Right. And they're really interchangeable uh, uh, as far as you know, being able to uh, engage a client and you know, put, put the right resource on right. the team. Yeah, but I, you need that on the team. You need someone who's going to own that DevOps aspect of what you're right. doing. And I think about that, we talked about that in the first uh, in the first module, right? Like right. it has to be automated. So as you're building it, right, it's not one of those things where you build it and you just throw it over the fence and somebody else catches it and then automates it, right? So we've, so we've done that for a while right. um, as organizations. And, and it's you know, painful. It's it, painful. It causes right. a lot of issue, a lot of pain right. because communication breaks down. Right. And, um, and, and what you have are two organizations who are in essence fighting over turf. Right. You know, and, and really what you want to do is bring those organizations together and form teams that have the IT pro and the developer, the IT pro focused on the DevOps, uh, the developer focused on you know, the API design and the, right. and the unit testing and the architecture, uh, you know, helping to pull together all the different um, technology stacks that you need as you, as you demonstrated through your demo. Okay. And then scripting that to, cre you know, to create the package, the product that we're now going to uh, uh, deploy into the cloud. And so, forming teams where you've got all the skills uh, together, working together as a team right. tightly, uh, you will have more success uh, with this approach than if you try to try to do it um, where you've got organizations that have Boundary. separation yeah. because due to you know whatever situation it is in, in the company, whether it's management uh, structures or or geographical uh, distances and things of right. that sort. Okay. Very cool. So let's uh, so let me bring us back on track here. Oh, so, okay. so yo, no, I, I asked you the question. So, uh, so what I want to do is get us back on track. So I did say we have a we have the last mile to go, right, with okay. our with our application. So, uh, so what I want to do here. Um, so we actually got that. We committed it. We created an image for it. Um, so what I want to do is get that up and running, right? So I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up the desktop again here. So we're going to do uh, sudo, sudo docker. Uh, we're going to do run. Uh, so we did minus uh, it last time, so we had an interactive session going. Uh, so now we're going to run this as a daemon. So it's going to run in the background, right? Uh, I'm still going to open up the same ports here and put an extra zero in there. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and link this uh, to the MongoDB instance, right? So that's already up and running as a, as a daemon. So we're going to go ahead and connect these two together so that they can be there. Oh, I'm a terrible typer. Um, there's a good story behind that. We'll save it for later if I need to break it out. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and give it a name. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just call this patient detail. Cool, so there's our app. We're linking it to our MongoDB da uh, database. Uh, we're also opening up ports so that we can expose it um, and, and expose it in Azure. Uh, we're running it as a daemon there. And then we're going to go ahead here and uh, tell it which image to use, right? So we made a new image earlier. So we're going to go ahead and, and run the Node.js patient detail image. And uh, we're going to go ahead now. Um, last time we didn't specify anything to run. Um, on the actual MongoDB database, we actually said to specify uh, MongoD, right? So we actually told it what service to run. Uh, so on this one, we're going to go ahead, since it's going to be a, a service, we're going to go ahead and tell it which commands to run. Um, so just as I did earlier, we're going to run Node. Um, and if we wanted to run it and debug and connect back to it, we could. Uh, but we can go ahead and run this as Node. Um, and we're going to go ahead and tell it to run the server.js file. And if we had it on a different path, we could say, you know, data slash whatever. But since it's in our root path, we're just going to say server.js. Um, and what's going to go ahead and happen is we're going to go ahead and hit enter here. Cross my fingers. I did it right. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a look at all the images that are running. And I guess i got to put the Docker command in there. That helps a little bit. There we go. So now we have our node.js uh, um, app running there, right? So we have it running on the Node.js server. We have this command running up here. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and remove the, I thought I removed it, but I'm going to go ahead and remove the app setup. 
command here. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that one. I think that's the right one. Cool. And let's go ahead and run this one more time. And now we only have two out there. We actually have the Node.js server with the Node.js patient details image that we had running Node server JS file. Um, and then we have the MongoDB. So now if we go over, um, take a look at this app again. And NBA, we'll go into patient. Cross my fingers, I did it right. Um, I love when that happens. All right, so there's all of our detail from our patient data. Um, we can go ahead to as well and put in the ID. And we are all set. I guess there's no ID for ID. I should uh, not type what I talk and actually just type what I mean to type in there. Uh, so there's uh, a patient ID for number one. So that's going to help us out uh, when we bring this back together in our last session. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to head back over here um, out of this, and we're going to head back into the, uh, the presentation. So I want to just come back, um, circle back around to the difference between containers and microservices. I think I, I, think I made that point pretty, pretty clear right? in this, in, this, uh, in this module that containers are a way to deploy microservices. right? Containers are not microservices themselves. Um, they could be big monolithic apps. So if I had a huge Java application or a big .NET application, I could put it in a Docker container and I could deploy it just like I do on-premise today right? in a VM. Um, it would be super happy with that. Um, there's no rules to break, so it let me do it for sure. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't go back to the thing that you and I have been talking about, Bob, which is you know, the microservice architecture, right? Like, how do we get to that? Um, you know, we always have a way to deploy, right? So whether that's a container, or it's automation, or built-in stuff in Azure, or, or other tools like Chef and Puppet, right? There's always a, a way to deploy, right? And some tools are easier than others. Um, but it's really about the architecture, right? So, so when you're building apps, right, um, you know, just because you use Docker in a container, and if you shove everything in there, right, it's not really a microservice. So, so I just really just wanted to, in this module, you know, make sure that we discern the difference between containers and microservices. Right, you need to go back to the definition. Is it, does it do one thing and do it well? Right. Is it autom autonomous? Is it isolated? Um, is it programmable? Is it configurable? Right. Uh, you know, all of those properties that we went through and uh, we talked at length, you know, you kind of have to, as you go through your design effort, ask your, keep asking yourself, are we, you know, are we staying, coloring inside the lines here? Are we staying within, you know, this definition? And if you find yourself, uh, you know, sort of, you know, expanding the capability of this microservice and say, so, well, we should do this, and uh, we, maybe we should make it do that. And, right. And all of a sudden you're looking at it and say, well, now it's doing two or three things, four things, it's starting to look monolithic, and you need to, you right. know, t take a review on that and step back. Right. And I think about that if we bring up, you know, my virtual machine here, and I were to go back and, you know, take a look at the code here, uh, what's, what's really interesting about the code is, you know, I have this broken up, and, and I think I, you know, I showed this in the in the API in my example data, or actually I, I showed it in my, my model too. Um, I actually am probably doing too much in this model, right? So I actually have, um, you know, I have, you know, I have my information about my patient here, and then I have their doctor information and their insurance information, which is maybe a great it's a great point to start, right? Like when you're doing a, uh, you know, a, a Minimal viable, viable product. product. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. We said at the same time. Yeah. Right? But, uh, but yeah, so, right. so I was going to say MVP, but I should probably say the right thing because you know there's lots of other uses for MVP. But um, you know we have lots of acronyms at Microsoft. Right. So uh, so so there we go. So we have we, we have all the information there. So really, if I wanted to, right, thinking about this from an architectural perspective, you know, I might have my patient detail service, and I would have my doctor detail service, and then you know an insurance detail service. And if I wanted to, I could wrap those all up into a single API, right? So, uh, which would be really interesting and probably the right way to go. Uh, but to get this all done, I just kind of put it all together, which was uh, refactoring is is an important right. uh, part of what we do. So we're going to you know take that first iteration and we're going to look at you know did we get it right? Uh, and if we didn't get it right, again, the lean engineering approach is you pivot. And refactoring is always part of pivoting. And you want to say, okay, well, let's you know take the next iteration of the design and breaking things out into their you know final grain detail, but at some point you also have to know when to stop, right? right. So what you don't want to end up with is, is a solution that has a thousand microservices that might be, become absurd at some level. Right. So it's really, it's really about knowing um, uh, at what point is the right, right point to say, okay, this, this is the right surface area for this capability. Right. Right, and that's a really good point, right? So, so you don't want to you don't want to cut it too thin, right? right? But you don't want to be like you don't want it to be too wide either, right? right. So, right. so you want to make sure you get the right balance of, you know, I guess it all depends on application design, architecture, right? Team setup, um, and then how you deploy it, right? So, so you know, if, if you put you know really thin slice, you're going to do lots of deployments, right? Yeah. And it's okay 
to maybe not get it perfect the first time. That's right. fine. Um, if you are doing things this way, it's much easier to refactor a small bit of code right. than it is a monolithic solution. So again, there's, there's lots of upside to taking this approach. Certainly, as we discussed, it's not without its challenges. Right. But, um, but you know, the, I think that the, uh, the upside outweighs the challenges. Okay. And, um, and then, so what I would say, too, is just, you know, there's lots of information out there about containers, right? Um, I was new to containers a few months ago. Um, they're actually really portable. Um, I like them. I like using Azure websites and Azure App Services and Service Fabric, too. So um, I really just choose the tool that works for me, right? Um, I did want to just show this today because, you know, Azure is, you know, it does support open source, right? And it does support other platforms besides just Windows development. So we want to make sure and reiterate that today. Um, also, you know, make sure that we make the distinction between microservices and containers, right, which is really good. Um, but there's lots of material out there for Docker. There's a ton of information on the Docker website, right? That's a good place to look. Um, so go out there and look. Uh, and then there's lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of labs and, and blogs about how to do things in, in, uh, in, um, in Docker. So, so it's a really vibrant community. So um, if you haven't tried it out, I'd go try it. Um, if, you're, you know, if you're looking to figure out what container technology is, um, I'd also go back and you know, some of the demos that uh, Bob is going to do uh, later in this is going to show you how to do it with Azure. Um, there's also the opportunity for you to go and um, explore, right? Um, and find the right technology for the, uh, for the apps you're building. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, when you, you dig in, you realize you can really take, you know, take this approach with lots of different languages and technology stacks. Um, and in fact, as we discussed earlier, if you've got a, a geo-dispersed team, you could have different teams using different technology stacks. Right. But they can all work together because uh, you know, the way you're doing the, the integration is at the API level, which is using open standards. Right. All right, and so with that, uh, we're going to wrap up this module. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a meal break. Uh, and we'll be back in, in about an hour or so. Uh, so check back then, um, and we'll start module three. Hello, and welcome back to today's Microsoft Virtual Academy for Microsoft, uh, microservice architecture uh, using Docker and Microsoft Azure. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and continue on. Uh, we've, we've been through a couple modules. We've been through module one where we took a look at what a microservice is and a little bit about the history and where we got to and how we got to microservices, I guess. Um, and then we took a look at Docker containers. So I did a, a demo. We talked a little bit about what containers are and, and maybe containers are not microservices, so they're not. Um, so we, we kind of had that. Um, so we have a lot of questions around that, which we're going to answer here in a minute. Um, but as we continue on here, what we're going to do is go into Module 3, where uh, Bob's going to take us through uh, microservice architecture for .NET. Right? So there was a question that we had about, is there going to be some .NET code? So we're definitely going to cover that uh, today. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that in our next module. And then after that, we're going to bring it all back together. Uh, Bob showed us an example of an application, uh, a pharma application that's running um, Internet of Things and Microsoft.net and all that great stuff um, that's going to happen in Azure. So we're going to see all that during these uh, next two modules from a demo perspective. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, before we get into module three, what we're going to do is go ahead and answer some questions. Um, so we're going to go ahead, I'm going to let Bob fill the first question. So the question is, how would the microservice principles apply uh, where you have an ERP and services sitting around it? So, you know, it's, uh, as I engage with clients, what I find is <clears throat> sometimes the very first thing I always say is it depends, because it, it really does. It depends on what are you trying to accomplish? What are the business goals? Um, you know, you've got existing uh, software out there. You have your ERP systems. You may have built some services, as you said, that surround that, that are providing uh, um, some access to that data. As you move to microservices, um, you know, what you might have to do is, is think about how you might integrate your new development with your existing environment. Right. Um, you might build microservices that are talking directly to ERP, or you might decide, I want to put loose coupling between you know, my microservices and my existing set of services right. that are surrounding the ERP. And, and look, again, find that separation of concerns, create a seam uh, of loose coupling so that you can um, you know, take advantage of cloud platform integrating with what you have on premises. Okay, very good, very good. So that's, uh, that's a good, and we kind of talked about that in the first one, having the existing monolithic apps, you know, I think of, ERPs that may not be monolithic, but 
They're big, right? They're big. And uh, and then connecting to them, right? It's it's just another service. So it, just being mindful about how you connect to those and interact with them in a microservice, right? Much like you would a data store, right? It becomes a dependency, right? It becomes a dependency in the background. All right, and so we're going to move to the next question here. So what is the difference between a Docker container and an IaaS VM in terms of functionality and the cost per instance? Um, so what I will tell you is that a Docker container runs inside of an IaaS VM, right? So it actually requires a Linux host to run. Um, so much like I did, I actually spun up a Linux virtual machine uh, before I did the demo, right? I want to do that during the demo. It takes like 12 minutes to get a VM running, so um, I only have a little bit of time to do that. So I actually pre-planned that. Um, and then what I did was I... Um, I put um, the I put the uh, container inside of the VM to run. So um, so once I do that, um, I put the container in, and then the um, and then the IaaS VM actually becomes the host for that. Uh, so whenever you're running like an Azure website or some of those things, you don't have to worry too much about that, right? Because you're not worrying about the virtual machine in the background. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in the container, right? So when you're running a container, um, it does require a host, uh, and that host just happened to be a Linux VM that I already spun up before. So um, I already had those in place. Um, so from a cost perspective, you're not actually paying for the container, you're actually paying for the host VM, the IaaS VM that you're running in Azure, right? So depending on how many containers you want to run and the horsepower you want behind it, depends on the, uh, the container or the IaaS VM that you would go and set up. So. And uh, the next question here, so uh, so Bob's going to take this one. So uh, the question is, let's say that you have a workflow in which you have a long-running ETL. All right, so you know, first point I'll make is, remember, not everything needs to be a microservice, right? So we always want to find the right architectural pattern and approach um, for uh, the various uh, components uh, of software that we're building to solve the problem. You know, it, it might make sense that uh, you, could, you could take uh, what is currently a uh, um, uh, an ETL kind of process and refactor that as a microservice. Maybe uh, it's kicked off by placing a message in a message queue or something like that. Again, you know, it depends uh, on on what what you're trying to accomplish, what kind of uh, interoperability right. you need, um, and but always trying to make sure that uh, as, the, as you are evolving your software environment, that you are providing those that loose coupling. Right. And then, so I would also just note that, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about microservices and the microservices that are running in Azure. Um, there is a service called Data Factory, which I have on my desktop here, uh, which you can go out and take a look at, right? It's in a preview, uh, but if you're looking for the ETL transformation tools as a service, right, so that you're not having to write your own microservice or spin up your own service uh, and do it as a SaaS service, uh, there's already something available to you. And if you're looking for other offerings like, you know, if you're trying to do ETL to some other data formats, right? So whether you're going to use, you know, custom process, there's batch processing in Azure. Um, we also have things for MapReduce, right? And there's all kinds of tools and functionality and, and first-party services, right? So if you go into features here and, and take a look at the services, um, there's just a whole bunch of services that you can use uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish in Azure, right? So it's not just IaaS VMs. Um, I would really take a look at all the uh, first-party services that we have, right, that are running in Azure uh, that you can take advantage of. And you're going to show some of them today. We're going to talk about event them, hubs right? and stream analytics uh, a little later and, right. and API management and document DB and Redis. I mean, we're going to look at a lot of these services. Right. There's quite a few. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and answer another question here. Um, so there was a question about... Um, uh, moving containers uh, for service implementation, so moving between staging websites and production websites. Um, so um, in in Docker, whenever I was using Docker, um, I actually use the commit functionality, which writes it back to the local persistence store uh, for images. Um, you can also do an export function or a save function, which would actually turn that into a zip file or a tar file uh, on Linux. Um, it compress it, and then you'd have the ability to go out. Um, I would look at the difference between export and save. One of them saves state, and one of them doesn't. But uh, what what I would do is move that, and then put it out into a repository somewhere where you can pull it down uh, and then redeploy it as an image. So um, there's also an import function that you can use to to, to for that functionality. Um, but if you're on the on the Azure side and you're using a, a uh, service factory or using app services or those sort of things, um, there's already built built-in functionality for um, staging websites and, and things like that. So there's actually something called deployment slots. I'm not sure if you're going to cover it later, but um, but uh, if it's something that uh, you're interested in, uh, definitely go out to Azure, take a look at deployment slots. There's a mechanism out there where you can actually do um, A-B switching, you can do A-B testing, uh, you can actually create a deployment pipeline of 
uh, look-alike servers right in 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 the uh, Azure space. So that's pretty straightforward. All right, and the next question is uh, it's pretty interesting for me. Um, so I actually showed you a Node.js app, and, and the question was, apart from Node.js, um, I thought you could run ASP.NET 5 um, in Linux. And you certainly can. So we announced at Build um, that there is the new .NET Core 5 runtime for ASP.NET 5. Um, and you can run that on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, I actually didn't have that and didn't show it today. It was just easier for me to do the Node.js implementation in the container. Uh, but it's something you can do. You can go out and put the core runtime um, and run um, ASP.NET 5 um, on a Linux VM if you need to. So it's certainly something you can do um, and put it in a container and move it around. Um, or you can just use the Azure service and it's already implemented for you. So it's kind of up to you and how you want to manage it. All right, and then the next question uh, for me, so I'll, this will be my last question, and then it'll be Bob's turn here. So, um, so there was a question around connecting containers. So um, the question was, um, they de I deployed common services in one container and, and another service in another container. Um, is this kind of architecture right? Uh, it definitely can be right, especially if you're thinking about it from a microservice architecture. You might actually have multiple containers running different apps right, on a, on a server. Um, and then if you want to connect those together, um, I actually did something on the command line that you might have seen or maybe not have seen, which is why you're asking the question. Uh, but you'll see here um, on the run functionality, I actually have a link um, uh, attribute here. We're actually linked um, the Mongo database to the actual um, application that I was running. And so how that link uh, works is you actually put in the link, the name of the uh, container that you want to link to, and the alias for that container, which is really important. Um, so I use MongoDB in both. Um, and the reason why I did that is because internally in my application, uh, in my connection string, I was using MongoDB. So one of the things you get with the alias when you put it in um, is that it actually makes um, a, a, an entry for the host name uh, in the container that you're running. So whenever you want to call that on the alias, it knows how to get back to uh, the container that it's linked to. Um, so that's how you link those together. You can link multiple um, containers together. Um, but they have to be on the same host when you do that. So if you're using something where you're, you have one container on one host and one container on the other, um, you need to definitely have a contract in place where they can call each other or have ports open if you're doing something like MongoDB across instances. All right. All right. And then the last question there is, um, based on what you've shown, so far it appears that microservices are SOA combined with best practices. Um, so I'm going to let you take that one. Sure. So. You know, the question goes into some detail and, and basically asks her, uh, after saying, okay, this looks really good, but it looks like it's missing some pieces like uh, transaction support and um, uh, resumability. And, you know, the point I'll make here is, you know, let's say resumability. You know, that's going to come from the cloud platform. So Azure has the ability to, to you know, to restart, restart services, um, handle that fault tolerance. So, you know, these are capabilities that, that you're going to rely on the platform to deliver. And as far as transactions, if you require transactions, there's nothing stopping you from, uh, you know, leveraging you know, your existing investment in WCF, uh, deploying that as cloud services. And, and you know, the, the question I would have back is, how is your code isolated? How is one service isolated from the other? So right. my experience, a lot of service-oriented architecture solutions are actually monolithic services. So it's a right. big, it's a big chunk, of, chunk of code that has lots of endpoints. And you know, we would want to sort of revisit that and say, are there ways you can, you can vertically slice that into right. services that can be deployed independently, they can be isolated from one another, but there's nothing stopping you from taking advantage of existing SOAP protocols and, and WCF capabilities. Yeah, and that's definitely true. So think about some of the WCF today and, and right you can have transactions on top of that um, and I would just say whenever you're using those type of technologies just to go back and say great you know if I'm using this as a standard do I need to have transactions for everything right do I need to build my whole stack and so uh, or can I just do this slice right if I'm doing a microservice I can do this slice and transaction support because I need it and then I can use a lighter weight um, mechanism, right, like Web API or Node.js and these other ones um, that's going to allow me to be more flexible and, and actually speed up deployment, right? Right. All right, so good point. what we're going to do now is we're going to move into Module 3. <clears throat> so the topic for Module 3 is microservice architecture for .NET. So we're going to take a look at some uh, microservices uh, that I've built, and I've built these for the purpose of you know, demonstrating some of the patterns uh, uh, that, that we discussed today, and we'll see how different um, uh, capabilities in, in the .NET framework provide us you know, uh, the ability to create uh, these microservices and we'll actually touch upon a number of uh, features within Azure that these services rely on.
So the agenda is first talk about discoverability and composition. So discoverability is that idea that, you know, at runtime, I want to be able to discover the microservices dynamically and then, and then you know, look them up essentially in some kind of a, 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 a discovery service and then, and then find their endpoint and invoke them from there. We'll then dig into um, the services themselves. We'll look at how do I define routes and interfaces and do service implementations and data access. So if you recall the logical architecture, we're essentially going to walk that architecture from the top all the way to the bottom. And finally, we'll, look, uh, we'll do a review of DocumentDB and Redis Cache. Uh, we'll look at how you, know, you, you uh, program against those two microservices available right. in Azure using their uh, C-sharp SDKs. <clears throat> and finally, we'll look at Azure API management. So this is the service you would use in Azure that would allow you to um, bring back together all those microservices that you have uh, designed and deployed uh, separately, and they're, they're all isolated, but how do you then, <clears throat> excuse me, create a sort of a branded API across right. all of that so that developers who are consuming your API have the sense that it is one API platform. Right. Yeah, and if I, I guess if I would have thought a little bit more about, I did the Node.js application, right? right? And thinking about like, you know, document DB, right? So did I really need MongoDB as a container when I could actually just use it as a service, right? It would have been, it would have been awesome if, like, if I would have just thought ahead and been like, great, I could just use that, right? Like, you know, I think one of the things that you need to think about when you're, when you're creating microservices is how much do you really need to create versus how much you can leverage that Azure already provides you as a microservice, right? Right, and we'll, we'll see some of that as we go through Very these cool. examples. All right, so <clears throat> what we're going to essentially do is, as I said, we're going to walk through this logical architecture. Um, starting at the top, uh, we'll be looking at both this concept of a public API and a private API. So we'll first look at an administrative console that allows us to administer the metadata about all the microservices in our environment. And then we'll see how a client application uses that to discover two other microservices and compose them together in a simple UI. So really, you know, uh, I'll, I'll state up, up front, you're not going to be blown away by the user interface of <laughs> these demos that I've created. That's why they make me work in the cloud, all right? So, um, but the point is, is we'll see uh, some, some examples of, you know, the patterns that, that you can expect developers will experience as they start to adopt your APIs. So the first um, microservice that we're going to look at uh, that will demonstrate discoverability and composition is config M. So this was actually my first microservice. Okay. <clears throat> I said, you know, okay, I want to you know, learn about microservices. And I started to think about it, because I think like you, I, I, I typically think a bit before I write code. Okay. I don't know if that's makes good or not. Makes us efficient, right? <clears throat> Theoretically makes us efficient. Yeah. But I like to think about it. I said, well, you know, if I'm going to start to build a bunch of microservices, it might be good to have a microservice that knows about all the other microservices. That was sort of, a, you know, I don't know if that was a light bulb moment or what, but I decided I, I want to see how this goes. That, that yeah. kind of seems to make sense to me. <clears throat> so, so I came up with ConfigM. So the idea here is, is ConfigM will allow me to read and to write application uh, and service configuration information. So I said, well, let me write the spec for that. So my spec for my microservice, uh, it has to provide storage and retrieval of a model. So that was the name. No, now this is where, you know. The M came from? Well, the M stands for microservice okay. in the name. And then the model is the data contract, right? Right. So, uh, so I need, uh, so the configuration model is a data contract that contains all the metadata about a microservice. So then the categories of metadata that can be stored and retrieved is completely under the control of the developer. There's some, um, basic information like the name of the service and its description, what version is it, when was it last modified. Um, but then this model also has a collection of settings. So they're just named value pairs and that's extensible. So you know if you if you write a service and it has 10 properties that you want to store, config M can manage that. Okay. And if I write one and it has two, it can manage that as well. Cool. And then maybe we can add the uh, the service that we added for Docker, right? We will actually do that live. Okay. Be afraid we're actually going to <laughs> <laughs> I had a configuration live. Hopefully, everything will work. All right, so um, now it's very useful for managing URIs and API keys and database connection strings. Um, you can even take serialized objects and store them as strings. Um, it can be used to bootstrap a collection of microservices providing uh, information for those services to communicate with one another, and that's the demonstration right. we're going to see. Provides both a developer API and an administrative, administrative API. And, and in this example, I've actually written an SDK both for the public API as well as the administrative API. Okay. And we'll see examples of that. So here's the model. 
So as you can see, at the, the, the model itself, the, the metadata about a microservice is going to have, <clears throat> excuse me, a name and a description. It will have a unique identifier, and that becomes important when you want to start to leverage uh, some of the querying capabilities in DocumentDB, as well as the uh, uh, in-memory cache capabilities of Redis. Um, so that ID will be, is guaranteed to be unique. I'm using a, a GUID there. And also, I carry around in, uh, in all my models a uh, cache time to live. So that, again, will be used with Redis. So if I want to store this model, someone's, someone requests a model, and it's read out of the underlying database, I can cache that in Redis. So if someone else comes in and requests the same thing, I'll grab it out of cache instead of hitting the database. So very simple uh, uh, pattern there. And then there is the version, the date it was modified, and then the settings, which are is simply a name value pair collection. I went through the exercise of defining the API. And as you can see, when I did that exercise, I discovered that, hey, there's, there are some CRUD operations that um, I want to make available, but only from an administrative point of view. And then there were you know, these other Git operations that I want any application or any other service to be able to have access to. So this is where, you know, again, was kind of another light bulb moment that there are really two uh, aspects to a microservice. There is the, the public API, and then there is this more of this administrative or private API. So you can see that the CRUD operations are on the administrative side. I want to create, I want to update, I want to delete, and I want to be able to get, get all models. But from, um, you know, think of it from an application perspective, really what you're saying is, well, you can get one model at a time. So you have to supply a name or an ID. And that was, that's how I designed the API. And finally, uh, what I'm showing here is the configuration as it's deployed into Azure. So I'm, uh, I actually, uh, and this was this is one way to do this, not the only way. Right. But they're essentially implemented as two separate ASP.NET Web API implementations: one for public, one for private. They share Redis cache and a Document DB uh, store, um, and then I've placed them under API management, so that it requires. Um, administrative approval to be able to subscribe to these APIs. Okay. So that's how I'm controlling access to these APIs. And then on the front end, I've, I've written SDKs that can be used. Uh, we'll see one example of it being used by an administrative console, and then another example where they're being used by an application. So with that, why don't we start to walk through some examples walk through the here. Code. All right. So the first application I'm going to show you is a very simple WPF application. Again, this could be implemented as a web page, or um, it, and because we're actually working against REST APIs, this could even be all done through scripts. Right. But I wanted to visualize this for you. I wanted to create a, a simple UI to say, you know, the, here's the concept. I have this application, and if I start it up, it's using the ConfigM SDK to be able to talk to the config. REST APIs. And so through those APIs, you can go and get, the first thing it does, it goes and it gets a list of all the models that are in the store. Now, one of the things I actually wanted to show you was the store itself. So I'm here on the preview portal. And if I browse to my DocumentDB database, what we'll see come up here is that there are four databases. We're looking at ConfigM right now, and I, I have three others. We'll touch upon those as we go through the day. And if I click on the ConfigM database, I'll scroll down, and I'll see that there is a collection called the model collection. If I click on that, now I'm going to have access to the documents in that store. So I'm going to go ahead and do the Document Explorer. As that comes up, we'll actually see that there are four documents in the store that we just saw listed on our user interface. There's one here. This is all the information as it's stored in DocumentDB, so that we're looking at the JSON structure mm -hmm. for, for um, uh, in this case, ConfigM. Uh, we could also look at, uh, there's another microservice called RefM, which is our reference data microservice. Here are, the, here are all the metadata about that service. So there you can see its ID. You see the date it's modified, the name, the description, the version, cache time to live, and then the settings. In this case, there are four settings that are being stored for this particular service. Very cool. So if we go back to our application, 
Well, if I do this right, stand by. There we go. What we'll see is really a representation of what I just showed you in the store, but now uh, displayed in a, in, a, in a client application. So I can come down and I can, I can click on, on the uh, uh, microservices on the left-hand side and I can see the metadata on the right-hand side. So, you know, for example, if I wanted to make a change to this particular service and let's say change the version number, I could do that and I could do a save. Well, that can only be done through the administrative API. So, so this console um, uh, is, is using the administrative APIs to be able to perform that, that transaction back to DocumentDB. And as we want to do right now, we can add a new configuration. Very cool. So if I do that, I want to come in here and say we want to do the uh, patient I'm going to make sure I spell things right. Patient details. Boy, you thought you were a bad typist. <laughs> and the description provides patient, doctor, and insurance data. Cache time to live. Well, so we want to go with 10. What okay. version of this? We just deployed it. It's 1.0. All right. And maybe we want to add a new attribute, the dev API. Cool. And so I actually, uh, we, uh, we're prepping another uh, part of the demo. And we know that this is actually now the location of that service. So I'm going to go ahead and add that. Yeah, we can get a little more behind that as we get closer to uh, the API management piece. Exactly. So that's the location. I'll go ahead and save that. And that was saved. So now if I go back to my portal and I refresh, theoretically, there should be five. And there are. And if I click on that fifth document, there it is. There's the model now for our patient details microservice. That's very cool. And so that's the admin API. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit about this. I think it's behind API management right now and you use right. the keys on that to actually restrict who has access to it. Exactly. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to um, go into some detail on API right. management, how all that works. Yeah. But what this is showing you now is that any application that wants to use these microservices, right. it doesn't need to know the physical location of all these services it only needs to know how does it, can it talk to the config M microservice. Right. And if it can talk to config M, it can dynamically look up these, this metadata, this configuration information, read the setting for the dev API, right. and then prepare the, uh, the rest, uh, the, the, the strings that will eventually be invoked as rest APIs okay. in that application. All right, so we go back to slides. So the next thing that we want to do, what we saw then was, um, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Let me go back to demos, sorry. I did want to show one additional demo. We'll actually walk through some code on this one. So the example here is I want to actually show an application that's going to use config M. Okay. I almost skipped that step. All right. So here I am in an application that, again, a very simple WPF application. And the first thing it's going to do is initialize the client SDK for talking to config M. So it needs to have its developer key, which, again, we'll cover how that works in API management a little later. And out of just the default configuration manager app settings, it's getting the location, the physical location of that service. For that's config the, M, right? For config M, but that's the only physical location it needs in its own application settings. Okay. If we continue past that, the first thing that we're going to do is actually make a REST call through the config MSDK to look up the ref M, the reference data microservice model, right? The configuration data. So let me go ahead and step into that. Here's an example implementation of an SDK. This is, this is using the, um, by the way, one of the areas of reuse in this example is this SDK implements the same exact interface as my service does on the, on the server side. Okay. So, so n that's how you can get consistency. So anytime you would, you would make a modification to a microservice, 
you'll know immediately through your build environment that the SDK will break <laughs> right. because it will be have a missing uh, uh, implementation of an interface. So therefore, you know, you always have to keep those synchronized. I'm going to go ahead and start to build up the API URL to be able to invoke over REST. So I'm building that up. I'm checking to make sure there's a developer key and I'm appending that. And so the end result is I will have a URI that looks like this. All right. So I'm actually able now to uh, invoke that API. I have a library to do that, REST, REST library. We'll make that call. And now that JSON for that model is available. Actually, that's the wrong viewer. Let me do the uh, JSON visualizer. There we go. So now we can actually see the metadata coming back for RefM. And there is the dev API. That's the setting I'm interested in to be able to use from this application. Okay. So I have that information now. And I'm going to return that. So that was this call. I'm using the config MSDK, and I'm making the git by name rest call back to my microservice. I've looked up the model. And if I step past that, now I actually have that as an object that I can, I can use in my application. I'll do the same for profile. So profile is another microservice that provides user profile information. So I have reference data. Reference data are things like uh, the states of the United States, um, country codes, language codes, uh, things of that sort. Okay. All right. So my seat just decided to <laughs> drop by five inches. So excuse me. Um, so the next bit of code, what am I doing? I'm actually going to now initialize the SDKs for reference data and for profile. So now I can invoke those services from the client. So here I am, again, reading the dev API setting out of the reference model and uh, applying that to the RefM client SDK. And the same for profile. So now the first thing I'm going to do is use the SDK for RefM. All right. And I've read the, the URL out of uh, the, the uh, configm model. So I've initialized this. So if I step in, now we see another call. This is going to set up the get all by domain. So in reference data, a domain would be something like states or zip codes uh, or language codes or country codes. So what I'm uh, doing is I'm saying I'm interested in getting all the entities, which would be members of a domain in right. reference data. I'm interested in all of the, the 50 states. I want to get that list. Right. So I'll step through building up the URI. I'll make that call. And now, as you can see, I've got the JSON for all of the 50 states. So each entity in this list will be one of the states. And we can see for the model there is it has both the code AL and the code value Alabama. In this case, it's linked to the US entity. It's part of the domain states. Uh, sequence zero means it's alphanumeric listing. And then I have additional attributes. Right. And we have our unique ID and our cache time to live. Cool. So I'll step past that. I now have the list of 50 states. I'm now going to just throw that up on the UI. And there we go. So now I have my list of 50 states. I've read that out of the reference data from the reference data microservice. Right. Now what I want to do is compose this with another this information with another microservice profile. So I'm going to look up all the employees that are based in Massachusetts. Okay. So to do that, I click on Massachusetts, and now um, I'm able to call the get by state uh, API on the profile microservice, passing in the code, in this case, MA, for the state of Massachusetts. Again, using the, S the client SDK for profile M, I go and I get all the users, and now they are listed up on the UI. And if I click on one of them, uh, I can see all the data that came back for that user, which is their, their address information, their phone, their email, uh, and all their other social networking okay. attributes. 
Right? Very cool. So that was an example where we used config M to dynamically look up location of services, and then we invoked two services of interest uh, and composed them together in order to populate this user interface. Okay, and that was a really good example of you know breaking up. Like you could have put that all in one application, right? So right. So. In theory, you wouldn't even need to config them at that point, right? You have states and all that other stuff. But if you wanted to maintain that stuff separately, like you've done, right, and you've actually put uh, the, the states right in a different microservice, right? Like you have a profile service, and then you have a, is it a state service? Where, or the, the reference data The service. reference data service. Right. How many applications need reference data? Just about all of them, right? Right. And so, you know, uh, you can easily envision taking something, a cross-cutting concern like reference data or user profiles, and turning those into microservices that all of the applications in, in your uh, enterprise can take advantage of. Okay, very cool. That was almost as cool as your chair just dropping. Yeah, my chair well. dropped 10 inches, so <laughs> I, feel, I feel short right now. All right. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll go back to, uh, let's go back to slides. All right. All right. I think we're on routes and interfaces, right? Exactly, so now we're gonna kind of drop down. We, 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 we went through that top part of the architecture, and we saw what the experience is like for developers using our APIs. Now we're going to actually dig into uh, one of those APIs and, and walk through the layers of code there. Okay. So the one we're going to look at is RefM. This is our reference data microservice. And we're going to examine you know, how do I define the routes for those APIs, uh, the, the interfaces, the service implementations, and do data access. So again, we talked about RefM a bit. It's an application reference data microservice. Right. And reference data is uh, any kind of data that's used to categorize other data. Um, you know, there's some standard reference data examples as we discussed, like zip codes and states and country codes, but I'll bet everyone who is viewing this, in their company they have their own set of sure. reference data, their own um, acronyms and abbreviations that um, really mean, that could be uh, define their organizational structure or the products that they build and sell. And you maybe, know, maybe we need to make an acronym <laughs> Dictionary for Microsoft. Uh, my understanding is there's not enough cloud storage yet for all of the <laughs> acronyms, so they're they're working on that. Um, so we'll hear more about that maybe at the next build. All right. Uh, so uh, reference data, it's sometimes called lookup data. Uh, it's organized by uh, domain. That's the language of reference data. Do you know there are conferences for reference data? So you can actually, oh, wow. uh, there's an, an entire part of the industry that's devoted to reference data and all of the standards around reference data. So you know they use this language of domains and entities. It kind of gets mixed in with some of our software yeah, development say, terminology, like, yeah. so it can get a little confusing. But you know domains are things like states and countries, and then um, uh, uh, an entity, which is a member of a domain, can have attributes. Um, and in the example we saw, you know, we looked up the state of Massachusetts whose code value, whose code is MA and whose code value is Massachusetts, but then had a set of attributes. And that, in my model, as we'll see, is an extensible name value pair. I kind of like that structure because it, it gives me extensibility without necessarily changing the data contract or the API. Right. <clears throat> so uh, the things you can add to a... Uh, to uh, an entity would be things in the case of states could be the population of the state, the capital, uh, square miles, and things like that. And you could you could really uh, get pretty creative, you know, with attributes on on these uh, reference data right. entities. Uh, so this is the model. Now, and this was the second microservice that I built, and I got a little more clever. Uh, and I said, well, you know, all of my uh, data contracts seem to have an ID and a cache time to live. Maybe that should be in a base class. Uh, <clears throat> so I refactored and I said, okay, I'm going to put that in a base class. <clears throat> and, then I'm, and then I'm going to derive from that. In this case, entity will be derived from model base. And I'm going to add there the code, the code value, the attribute list, um, link. Link means that an entity like um, the state of Massachusetts could link to the country entity for United States. Okay. So that's what link is about. Um, domain is like states. And then sequence would be, um, is, it, is it alphanumeric ascending, descending? Um, but there could also be uh, special cases for first and last. An example would be, how many times have you gone to uh, a website and there's a drop down for countries? And it's alphanumeric, but United States is at the top of the list. You know, that would be an example where you would mark the United States in your list of countries as having a sequence of first uh, and everything else is alphanumeric. So your UI can do the right thing. Um, and then there's name value pair for, for attributes. Again, same exercise of defining the API, 
what I realized is, hey, reference data shouldn't change very often. You don't want applications going and adding a 51st state, right? right? Or creating a new country or a new language code. Right. Reference data is really, is primarily read only. But where you need the other CRUD operations is in, is in the management of that data. So uh, as these uh, reference data standards groups meet <laughs> around uh, the, the world, they uh, might come up with new types, new categories of reference data, uh, new ways to, to um, uh, do abbreviations. Imagine those, those meetings. Um, <laughs> we're gonna come up with some new <laughs> abbreviations, people. All right, so, but you know, they come up with this information and we wanna, you know, from an administrative side, be able to populate those changes <coughs> back into our reference data store. So again, we need a public API and a private API. So let's go ahead now and walk through this, this demo here. So I think what I'll first show you again is reference, uh, the reference data microservice has its own uh, database and its own collection in document DB. And I'll come over, and in this case, I'm actually going to use the Query Explorer. So the way the Query Explorer works is, is you're actually going to type in you know, a SQL query. And we're going to structure it this way. So I'm going to select uh, e.star from entity e, where domain equals states, right? That's basically the query we've been doing through our um, the application. Through the, from the application through the microservice. If I run that right here, this is how I can actually test, and hopefully uh, did it right. No, I think you got to do e dot domain. You're gonna do e dot. That is correct. There you go. And I might the e dot star might not be right either. Let me try this. Do star. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Yay. So. <laughs> Thank you for your help, Chris. Ah, just, just a little help. <laughs> so what we can see here is, you know, this should now start to look uh, familiar, right? So we've got these uh, JSON documents in, in document DB. We're seeing the, the structure of the information as, as expected. We're also seeing some of the additional information that um, the document DB adds for all the documents. Um, and you can actually access this uh, in, in your queries and um, uh, through some of the other uh, capabilities in Document DB, we'll, re we'll review Document DB a little bit later, and, and uh, uh, we'll go over kind of all the things it can do. But you know, setting it up, uh, defining your model—that's uh, sort of the first step, right? And then getting this information into it um, through through uh, uh, some kind of uh, administrative API is is usually the way you would bootstrap some of this. Very cool. All right. So that's the store that we're going to be hitting. And now I will bring up this solution here. So what this is, uh, t -t -t close this out. What we're looking at here, let me zoom in a little bit, right? Is we're looking at the solution for the reference data, oh, get rid of properties, the reference data microservice and you can see what I'm doing is I'm pulling in a number of projects so back to our discussion earlier you know I'm, I'm creating a service I want to pull together all the various um, uh, components that I need uh, from a code perspective some of these are some reusable common libraries that all the microservices use in other cases they're very specific to this microservice like the iref dev interface is the is the interface that this uh, service is going to implement um, you see the service library there, that's the actual implementation. You see my uh, ASP.NET Web API here, and then of course our model is down below, right? So let me also then share with you, if I zoom back here, and just go to my desktop here. We, look at, we can look at how the source is actually organized. I go into my Git repos, and under utilities, this is this is how I have organized my code. It's again, not um, not the only way to do it, 
but this seemed to work well for me where I've taken the various uh, uh, pieces of functionality that I need and in order to maximize reuse, place them into their own uh, uh, folders in, in the repo so that uh, I can, I can ac just access the ones I need from the solutions that are pulling them all together. In this case, the web API solutions are really pulling all the pieces together. Right. But if we go down into models, you'll see there's a project for each of the uh, different uh, model, model types. Um, if, we, if we look at uh, common, we'll actually see the two libraries that are common across all the microservices. Right. Utility, that's the one that will uh, handle making REST API calls and dealing with JSON, deserialization and serialization using JSON.NET. Um, and the microservice store solution is the library that deals with data access, whether it's DocumentDB, SQL Database, Service Bus, um, you know, Azure Storage, all of that is in there. Uh, and I just use the piece that I need uh, in, the micro, in my microservice. And we'll step through some of that code. All right, so we go back into the solution. <clears throat> I'm going to run this, but one point additional I want to make here is what you'll notice as we go through this, I have one model and I have one controller. And this particular part of the solution the, the ASP.NET Web API piece is very thin. You know, the key here is this layer of your architecture may want to be replaceable. Right. So you might want to uh, replace this with a diff different way to do, uh, you know, over the wire communication in, a, in another uh, scenario. But everything below this, the service, the data access, uh, the API definition, all that wants to remain the same. So if I start this up, I'm going to just type in. I'm running this locally, but we'll hit the uh, we'll hit the document DB up in Azure. I'm interested in um, again the uh, we want to look up all the reference data for all the states. That same query we've been making. Now the first thing that happens in the controller is we instantiate the service class RefM. In the constructor. The first thing that this service class does, if you notice, this is the class that implements the IREF dev interface. We'll look at that in a second. Is I'm actually creating a data access class. So that's the next layer down. So you can see I've got very layered code. I go from the ASP.NET Web API down to a service class. The service class wants to access the data access class. Right. So it's going to instantiate that. And it's basically saying I'm interested in the NoSQL database, a cache, a Redis cache, um, the name of my um, Database is RefM, and the name of the collection is Reference Collection. If I step into that, we'll see that I create both uh, uh, a connection to Document DB and a connection to Redis Cache. So my data access class is managing the relationship between Document DB and Redis. Okay. And the logic around, you know, let's first check to see if it's in the cache. If it's not there, read it from the database and put it in the cache and then return it. All that is at, in the data access uh, right. class. So this is then uh, the code which is going to create uh, the connection to Document DB. So I've got my, my settings of, of where uh, that service is running in Azure. And I have the security credentials here. So I'm able to connect, connect to the database, connect to the collection, and I'm good. Now I'm back up at the protocol level. I've gotten the request to, to call the API ref entities domain and pass in the domain. So the domain here is states. We can see that. And I'm going to actually now step into, as you can see, this is a single line of code mm -hmm. at the protocol level. I've kept it very, very thin. And I'm going to step into my service class. So this is where we're actually, again, setting up that query to document DB. Select star from entity E, where E.domain equals states. And we showed how we could do that right. using a portal. And now we're doing it in code. So I set up that query. And I'm stepping into the data access class, which is going to call this select by query. And now I'm into the actual uh, implementation uh, uh, code against document DB. So I've written this in the way so it's fairly generic and it's reusable. Which model, which document type I'm using, I can pass in any, any one. Right. It's got the appropriate uh, uh, connection 
I'm grabbing out, you know, some of the uh, attributes of the, of, the, of the generic type being passed in, like its name, in this case, entity. I execute that query, and what I get back is a collection. I return that all the way back up to the top level. So now I have my collection, which I am going to return, and I should see the results here in the browser. And I may have timed out. Let's try it again. We'll step through a little quicker this time. There we go. Perfect. So there's the JSON now in, in the browser. Cool. All right. So just like you put states on the end of your domain there, if you were to put countries, right? Does that uh, return country codes in the reference database? Or? You would think so, right? How yeah. about language codes? All right, let's, let's try, try that. that. It's, in, it's impromptu, but I thought I'd just ask. <laughs> in theory, if I did it right, it should work. Stepping through all the breakpoints. And there we go. Now we've got language oh. codes. All right. Very cool. So, you know, here we have then. So to recap, what we, what we saw was the implementation of a microservice is probably not all that different than how you're building REST APIs today. Right. But what was key is I have isolated the reference data capability in, into um, its own unit of deployment. Right. And so this code, all it does is it knows how to you know, read and write reference data. Right. And I've deployed that into Azure. It has a well-known API that's under API management, which we'll take a look at in a moment. And, um, and, and any application can now access this uh, in, in a, using standard REST calls. Okay, yeah, that's very cool. So that way you're able to go in and, you know, each, I, I think about applications where I've been at and done development before, right? Each application kind of has its own reference data. You talked about that earlier, right? Where, you know, if you're doing states and you have 20 applications and they're all using states, there's, there's a different implementation in each one, right? So, right? so having this as a microservice that they can all call and rally around uh, totally makes sense, right? Right. So let's talk a bit more then about DocumentDB and Redis Cast because that that's what we're using down at that data access right. tier. Um, and so you know, what we saw is, uh, you know, I've already demonstrated it, but let's kind of recap DocumentDB. It's a NoSQL schemaless JSON document store. It's fully managed. It has a REST API, but there are also client SDKs. Right. So I'm using the C-sharp SDK for DocumentDB and the C-sharp SDK for Redis in my common library that's used by all my microservices. Right. Uh, but there are also SDKs in other languages. Right, I could have used them in mine, right? I could have called Absolutely. your reference data. You could have. Yeah, could have. I should have, probably. <laughs> um, and you can see it uses a SQL-like language to query JSON documents, um, supports storage and execution of JavaScript, providing transactional asset support, um, has tunable consistency, choose from four levels, strong, bounded, staleness, session, and eventual um, bounded staleness, I should say. And they, they're, they're provide that granular, granular well-defined, consistently, consistent levels, allow you to make sound trade-offs between you know, consistency, um, availability, and latency. So if you have an application that's writing, um, and then you have other applications which are reading, um, how up-to-date do you want that information that's being read? And that's kind of what you're controlling here. Okay. Um, So I see next up here you have uh, you have the databases, right? So you kind of laid out your models and, and how right. they we can fit. See, we can see all of the elements that DocumentDB supports, right? So we saw that there's an account. I had a database. I had a collection. Um, there are also users and permissions that you can apply. Right. Um, we saw documents in there and, and how they're defined, but you can also have stored procedures, triggers, user-defined functions. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty rich you know, uh, environment. It has a lot of the same capabilities you would expect in a database. Right. Traditional database. Here's the code you would use if you wanted to get or create a database. Again, using that C Sharp SDK. Very straightforward. If you have the connection string, you need the URI, and you'll get that out of the portal. Uh, once you create your instance of DocumentDB, right. you go to uh, uh, the keys, and it'll give you uh, all this information, what the URI is and what your key is for being able to securely access your instance of DocumentDB. Right. Then you can create a database. Um, uh, and, and, and provide its name, uh, and then, uh, can, and then uh, finally connect to that database. 
The next step is the collection, right? This is where you want to store your documents. So you can create a, a document collection, again, through a very straightforward uh, line of code um, and provide a name for that collection. And then finally, if you have documents, here's a very simple one. I want to create a customer, has a first name, last name. I can go ahead and create that document in, in the collection. I can then query that document from the collection. Right. Uh, one thing to realize is when you query, you're always getting back a collection. So uh, even if the result is a single document, it's, it comes back as a list. So typically, uh, you have some kind of a for each or some kind of list enumeration that, that comes after uh, the result of a query. Okay. Now, Redis Cache uh, is Azure Redis Cache is based on the popular open source Redis Cache. And uh, Azure provides a secure, dedicated cache managed by Microsoft. So I went into the portal and I said, give me Redis cache. It spun up. I chose the right level of scale that I wanted from that cache, the amount of memory and disk and all of that, uh, what I was comfortable uh, in, in, uh, from an affordability perspective. And uh, when it was done being created, I got back the connection string uh, the, and the, the necessary security token that I needed to connect to Redis cache. Right. Um, so, to, so to use Redis Cache, then from .NET, you will go to Nougat and, and uh, reference the stackexchange.redis package. Okay. Then in your code, you say, I'm using stackexchange.redis. Use connection multiplexer to connect to the cache and then perform a Git database. And that's how I'm, uh, I'm keeping uh, this, this uh, my data access tier. That's what I have. I have one of these, I have a, the iDatabase um, uh, reference that comes back from Git database. Okay. Then what I can do is when I have an object like customer, um, one thing as you saw that I like to do is I like to give all of my my uh, models a unique ID. <clears throat> comes in very handy when you want to store them in Redis. Right. So what you can do is serialize your object then to JSON, and then use the string set function of your of the Redis cache to say, here is the ID for the object customer.id.toString. So I'm taking the GUID, and that now becomes a unique identifier in Redis for this particular object. Right. I provide the JSON, which is the, you know, the string equivalent now of that object, and how many minutes do I want to cache for? And in this case, the example is five. Okay. So string set will put the object into the cache, and the next line that you see there, example, string get, what do you do? You pass in the ID. If I pass in that ID, I will get back the JSON for that stored object, which I can then deserialize into an object. Cool. So putting things into Redis, getting them out of Redis, it couldn't be easier, right? right? The key is make sure you plan probably for having a way to uniquely identify your objects. As you can right. see, I use, I, I use GUIDs in my, in my uh, models. Cool, very cool stuff. And that brings us then to Azure API management. Right. So we've been using this all along sort of behind the scenes, you saw a little bit here, you saw, right. a, dev, you saw a dev key being used and, and, uh, and so on. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go through, we'll talk about what API management can do, we'll go into the, um, the administrative console and the, and the developer portal and we'll show you how it works uh, in the real world. So what is API management? API management allows you to define a proxy that wraps your API. And as you define that proxy, you can even you know, add versioning uh, it's typically uh, one, uh, uh, one technique to, to provide versioning for your microservices is to actually add the versioning token uh, as part of the proxy URI that you're creating right. uh, at the API management level. It provides the documentation and an interactive console uh, for developers who are looking to use your APIs. You can define throttling limits, uh, rate limits, quotas for your APIs. Um, you can monitor the healthy API, so it's going to give you analytics. Right. The way that works is every API, in order to be invoked, the developer must provide a key. They must be able to you know, have subscribed to that API and gotten that key back and now use that key on every call. Well, API management that's going to collect all that information about who's calling, how often, and what kind of uh, stati statistics are they getting uh, uh, on each of those calls. Very so you cool. can really uh, see how your APIs are behaving. Um, you can bring modern formats like JSON and REST to existing APIs give you an example, you can actually take an API, put it under management, let's say it returns XML. Well, you can do what's called a policy injection and say, well, whenever this, what I want you to do is on the, um, uh, take the XML and turn this into JSON and return JSON instead. Okay. So if you want to say, hey, you know, we want to start to standardize on JSON, even though we've made this investment in all of these services that return XML, 
put them under management and just add a, and do policy injection. Possibly like SOAP and WCF, right? Exactly. Um, you can consolidate your multiple microservices into this single branded API and really you know, expose to the world uh, this consistent look and feel across all of your APIs and then gain analytic insights as I talked about. Cool. So this is a high level diagram uh, to kind of describe what you get. You're going to get um, an administrative portal what's referred to as the publisher portal. There you're gonna define the proxy for uh, your APIs. Your API is just gonna be able to plug into that proxy. And then developers will visit the developer portal and they'll, there they'll have to register and then request access to APIs. And then the administrator will be able to say whether they can or cannot access those APIs. So you actually get a level of control and organization around who has access to your APIs and who doesn't. Very cool. So let's demonstrate that. All right. I'm going to close out some windows here. We're going to go up to the Azure portal. I'm going to scroll down to API management. And you'll notice I have an instance of API management running. And down at the bottom of the screen is the manage uh, button. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And this brings me to the administrative portal. And the default view is I start to see, you know, some of the most recent um, analytics for various APIs. I can see that, uh, hey, Config M, the administrative service and the developer service have been invoked as of late. If I scroll down, I can see that, uh, oh, patient details. That oh, one's been yeah. used as well. And we have the patient M microservice, which is also uh, was used earlier today. And I've got some other microservices here. Now, how do you get started? Well, the first thing you do is you define an API. So let's see, we've been using that RefM microservice. Let's go look at that for a second. So this API has, been, has already been defined and you can see that this is the endpoint. It's HTTPS, home biomedical. Let me zoom in a little bit. Home biomedical.azure-api.net version one RefM. But that's the URL to the proxy. The actual service is, is actually at another physical location. But we've, we're wrapping that with the proxy. If I go to settings, I'll see that I have a very friendly web API name. I have it blank here, but you could actually provide a description. This is how you're seeing, you're actually building up documentation uh, right. about your services through this, through this administrative portal. Here is the actual physical location of that service. Here is the how I wanted it to be renamed. So now it's version one RefM, and then this below, as we looked at before, that is the, the address of the proxy. Also through uh, this interface, I can define operations. So here's an example where I defined a get entities by domain. Guess what? That's the one we've been calling all day, right? So here, I actually went in and I've, I've said, well, you know, the verb is get. And you can see I, I have all these other options for, for the verbs. Mm -hmm. I provide the, the URL template. Well, it's going to be slash entities, slash domain, and then it's going to have a parameter called domain. I provide a display name, nice friendly display name, and a description. And if I go to parameters, I can actually see that I have a, a parameter called domain and I can add a description there as well. And if there were default values, I could add default values here. Now, we, were, we went in earlier and we started to define the patient details microservice. Right. And so we we've, uh, uh, were able to set that up. Here is the location of that service. And we started to create operations, but we only did one. We did get all patient details. So let's go ahead and add an operation. Again, this will be a get. And it's going to be patient slash ID, right? Mm -hmm. The display name will be patient details by ID. And if I look at parameters, there's the idea, and this is going to be the patient ID. And I'll go ahead and save that. The next thing 
that you have to do once you define an API, by the way, the first time is you need to add it to a product. Now, that API is already part of the Pharma Trial Biometrics uh, a product. So the idea is they actually take your APIs and collect them into products, publish those products to the developer portal, and then you can actually assign specific developer groups to those products. And you do that by defining groups. If I come here, you can see I have administrators, developers, and I have guests, but uh, I could add uh, uh, additional groups and then assign users into those groups. Let's go out to the developer portal now. So up in the right-hand corner, it says developer portal, and I'm going to say open in a new tab. This, is, this site is automatically generated for you by API management. You can change the look and feel. This is the default look and feel. But you know, what it will do by default is put up the name of your uh, uh, company uh, up at the top here. We're Home Biomedical, and this is our API. When developers come and register and they're approved by the administrator, they will then be able to come to their profile page and actually see their developer keys. So they will have developer keys that, that'll be applied to specific products that they have uh, uh, requested to subscribe to. Once they have access to the products, they'll have access to all the APIs in those products. So for example, if I come down here to RefM microservice, let's say that was one of the microservices I wanted to um, subscribe to, and I go to Get Entities by Domain, what you're seeing here is, first off, you're seeing the documentation that was created. We can see it's Get Entities by Domain, return a list of entities that belong to a particular domain. We can see the request URL. <clears throat> we can see the parameter. We can see that the uh, subscription key is required. And we can even see examples in different languages. So if we wanted to see, you know, how would I call this API in C Sharp? You know, I can see that example here. If I want to see it in JavaScript, I can see that example. And of course, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing Objective-C or PHP or Python or Ruby, we have those uh, examples here as well. So the tool is actually generating sample code right. for you. And it's, it's creating all the documentation, right? So if you have developers coming and subscribing to your product and using your API, right? So if you add APIs and add descriptions and information, right? it's, it's filling in the documentation for you, which provides some discoverability, right? If you're not going as far as doing the SDK portion. Exactly. So you could actually, if you're using API management, you know, and you don't want to be in the SDK business, as we mentioned earlier, you know, API management is a great, uh, uh, a great way to produce the discoverability, the documentation, the subscription access, the security access to your APIs. Very cool. So the next thing that this uh, developer portal does is it allows me to actually try out the API. So if I click that, I actually get a, um, a screen where I can put in, you know, um, an input value. In this case, I'm going to pass in states for the domain. Um, it automatically knows that I'm subscribed, so it fills in my key for me. And I can go ahead and send that. And I get the response below. I can see all the headers, and I can actually see the data below. That's very cool. So let's check out the patient detail one that you oh, just you, did. You really want to check out your own would, API. Let's see if it works. <laughs> all right, we'll give it a shot. So all we'll right. go to the patient details microservice, and we just we just set that one up. You just actually deployed it this morning live. Right. Um, so we've got two endpoints: get all patient details and patient details by ID. So let's try get all patient. So we'll try it. Right. There are no um, parameters for this, so I can just go ahead and say send. Cool. And I should get back all the data, which I do. I have it below. So there's all that patient information, simulated patient information that is coming from your Node.js service. Very cool. And now if I try the one I just defined, let's hope I got all the syntax right. Yeah. I put in a value. Let's say I'm interested in patient one, two, three. And I scroll down and say send. Look at that. There you go. That's great. I actually got the JSON just for that patient. So now that we've taken your microservice, running on Linux, implemented in Node.js, and my microservices, which were written in C-sharp, but uh, deployed to uh, Azure, as Azure, Azure websites, but placed under API management, they're both now surfaced to developers who want to use them through this portal.
Right. They look identical. Right. They look you know, like they just belong to the same environment, yet we know that they're deployed independently, they're scaled independently, um, but a developer can now give, give right. an access, you can build a solution across these two. Yeah, areas. that's really cool. So, really cool how we bring them all back together uh, to make a product, right? And uh, and provide that consistency for the people that you're, you're, you're developing against your APIs. Exactly. So that really uh, closes out you know, this module. Mm -hmm. you know, we recap. We saw that um, how we could uh, take that logical architecture and realize it uh, using the .NET stack. Right. We created SDKs um, that leveraged you know, um, on the client side so that applications could dynamically look up the location of services, could create applications that compose services together. We saw how the internals of a service were implemented. ASP.NET Web API, I'm sure a lot of folks watching have that skill, right. but using it to actually create a, web, uh, a microservice. So it just, you know, it, was, it had one capability and it did it well. And we, show, we showed how we could use DocumentDB, Redis Cache, and API management to provide, um, you know, a level of, of capability, scalability, and management across all of those microservices. Right. So that's all really cool stuff. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a, uh, about a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back and what we're going to do is go over the fourth module uh, and we're going to cover the internet of things. We're going to cover um, IoT, uh, microservices, and we're actually going to show the end application where all these services roll up to um, at the end. Yep. So uh, we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. I'm going to get a new chair. Hello and welcome back to today's session for microservice architecture and Docker and Microsoft Azure. Um, so we hope you enjoyed the uh, third module, so we're going to go on and move on to the fourth module. Um, and before we do so, um, what we're going to end up doing is talking a little bit about what we've covered so far and we're going to answer some questions from the last module. Um, so in our first module we covered what is a microservice, right? So we need to know what that is and how to define it, you know, why it's important to us. Um, and then we did some demos with Docker containers, microservices, all that great stuff. Um, and then we moved over to the Azure API apps in the Microsoft Architecture for .NET. Bob did a really great job in showing us some work that he's been doing um, as it pertains to reference data and, and other things like that. Um, so then our next module here is going to be microservices and the Internet of Things. So we're going to get into IoT, which I think is the next kind of big step uh, in development. Right? And we're going to actually show the trial demo and some of the code that, that we've been working in and demos we've been working in are going to come back together. Uh, so it's going to be pretty great. Um, so before we continue on with that, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and answer some questions. Uh, so the first question here that we got in the chat was, uh, what's the difference between a service and an API? So you know, it's a it's a great question because I think you know the uh, you know you, we we sometimes think of services as as mm -hmm. the APIs that that we're programming to. Um, I like to step back as I want to think about a microservice. I think about it as a product, and it has a, a, a number of um, behaviors and capabilities. So, as a product, yes, it has a programmable interface. And as we saw, it could have a public programmable interface and a, an administrative programmable interface. So, different different interfaces providing different levels of capability. Um, if I put it under management, I can I can essentially provide documentation now for. Uh, my microservice. And uh, because it is uh, a product, I may organize a team around the ownership of that microservice and they're responsible for it through its entire life cycle. So, you know, depending on what you mean by a service or an API, um, we use those terms uh, in describing a microservice, but at the end of the day, I like to think of a microservice as, as a product with, with all the behaviors we discussed. It's, right. it's isolated, it's scalable, um, uh, it's, it's a unit of deployment, and it has you know, um, uh, it's, it's owned by a team through its entire development life cycle. Right. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question here. So the next question is uh, uh, the understanding that a microservice instance running on one data center can be resumed in a different data center uh, leveraging the Azure platform capabilities. And so I, I certainly think that's possible today. So you could certainly have two service fabric or microservices running um, in two different data centers, two different geos. Uh, and using something like Traffic Manager, right, to do the failover, right? Um, all you'd need to make sure, right, on the Azure platform is that you actually have synchronized data in the background. So if you have data stores, right, they have to be consistent. So if they do fail over, you have like a hot uh, backup. Um, so if you're doing something like SQL as a service, um, you get that built in. If you're doing your own database functionality, you just need to make sure that that's provided um, so that when it fails over to the web front ends, um, 
to the traffic manager that it, that it can actually take up the traffic and it knows where to start, um, where it left off on the other uh, failed service. Do you have anything to add to that, Bob? No, I think that's, that's spot on. You know, one of the things we want to do is we want to rely on the platform that we're deploying into to, to give us those, those capabilities. So, right. so Azure has the necessary uh, services that are configurable to provide that the high availability and the scalability and the fault tolerance and the failover, right? So it's something that um, you're going to uh, provide and it certainly is going to come into play in how we, how we do the scripting of deployment, the DevOps around those microservices. Okay. We'll help define some of those capabilities that that service needs at runtime. Um, and we'll be essentially configuring Azure to say, hey, something like this happens, uh, I want to go from east over to west and right. pick up over there. Okay, very cool. All right, and then, uh, so the next question here is, um, how would you go about handling high latency issues when microservices can be chatty? Well, first I would say is don't be chatty, right? So <laughs> uh, we've been talking about that for a long time in, in uh, distributed computing. It's better to be chunky rather than chatty. We want to avoid essentially going over the wire more than we have to. Right. Uh, so um, first step is to make sure that when you're making requests of a microservice that you're you're returning those, those data contracts, those models. Um, we don't want a microservice that says, hey, give me the first name of the customer. Now give me the last name of the customer. Right. Now give me their address. No. Give me the customer record. Give me that entire record and bring it back. That's a that's more of a, a chunky approach. Right. Um, but certainly, if you have a hot spot in your architecture, you've deployed these microservices, and we covered this in in, uh, in the first session in the deployment scenario. And all of a sudden, something unexpected happens. A particular part, a particular microservice, all of a sudden is becoming super popular, <laughs> and you didn't expect that. Well, if you've configured it in Azure to be elastic, Azure will take care of that scale up. Right. And of course, you want to be monitoring that, and you want the real time feedback. From from that environment to understand the health of what you're doing um, uh, of your environment, but having the cloud, having Azure provide that elasticity so that you can handle those those hotspots is key. Right, and I also think that you know one of the things to think about um, you know chatty versus chunky is right is that um, you know whenever we think about software development methodologies and patterns and practices we've been using uh, up until this point, right, building uh, the bigger applications and interior uh, architectures and things like that those all still fall into place, right? So we're not getting rid of them. So, so you don't go off and create a new set of rules and you know, create this very chatty application. Um, you still kind of stick to those rules, the, the architecture and, and patterns and practices we'd used before. Um, you just develop in vertical slices. Right. Right, so. All right, so let's, uh, let's go into the next question here. It says, does API management um, also provide composition capabilities? Uh, so what I'm going to look into that question and say is, as you showed and talked, well, you didn't show, you talked about, you know, hey, if your service is returning XML and you wanted to compose that back into JSON, um, you could do that, right, at the document uh, level. Um, I'm not sure that you can do that going back into data, uh, the API management, um, but, but you certainly can't compose documents. So it's not like an enterprise service bus, right? It's really just a proxy, right? Uh, right, it's a proxy for the service. It's allowing you to, in essence, rename your service so that you can have consistent naming across all your microservices. Right. You might have different teams that developed these APIs and they maybe they were developed at different times and all of a sudden maybe they don't all look the same. Right. API management, you can make them all look the same and have versioning, um, but it's not going to be automatically combining returns, you know, documents from multiple services into a single document and sending that back. It's not what it does. Right. Um, but you can do things, as, as Chris said, you can actually have, um, you know, a service that returns XML and have it go out as JSON. You could have JSON come in and have it turned into XML. Right. You can go both ways with the transformations, JSON or XML, however you need it. Uh, that's in one example of policy injection, um, but you can do lots of other types of policy injection as well. Right. Um, and so it's an area of API management we didn't go deep into today, but if you're investigating it, there's plenty of documentation online, the Azure portal, to, uh, to find out about uh, policy injection. Okay, and then I'm gonna go over the last question here. So the, uh, the last question is, is, can I define JSON types within the developer portal? Um, and so the rest of the question goes on to ask about, you know, will it create documentation for my JSON models, right, as I start to, you know, bring them in and out of, of APIs? Uh, and so the question, so the answer to that is no, right? So, uh, so the API management, the development portal actually has information about the service. It has information about the call, right? You saw the description. Uh, you saw information about the parameters, um, but it doesn't have any place to store information about the data that you may be transferring back and forth, right? So, if you're returning like a particular data model, like patient details, right? Um, it's not going to have any place for you to store information about that particular model. Um, but you would need to provide that, right, just as you would from a software development perspective for your end users. 
Good. All right, perfect. So let's get started here. So, uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Bob. He's going to actually take us on the, uh, the last module here for the microservices and the Internet of Things uh, in our trial software. Very good. So yeah, this next module, we've, we've named it Microservices and Internet of Things. And I can tell you that um, from my, my own team's uh, experience over the last uh, half year, um, I'd have to say that uh, our, our business is probably 80% Internet of Things. You know, why is that happening? Uh, and and uh, m the way I see it is the reason is Azure has taken Internet of Things and made it a commodity uh, solution. And we're going to see how that actually works today. So we're going to go over what does IoT mean to you. And I'm going to quiz Chris and see what IoT means to him and see if he gets it right. All right. Um, we're then going to talk about Event Hub and Stream Analytics as a couple of examples of the microservices that Azure provides for helping you build a complete end-to-end -end IoT solution. And then we're going to see how a solution is actually put together using Event Hub, Stream Analytics, Azure Storage, custom microservices, and SignalR and ASP.NET uh, websites. So end-to-end -end from devices all the way to visualization, and that we refer to as the home biomedical microservice demo. Very cool. All right. So, what does IoT mean to you? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. So if you think about IoT, um, there's, there's definitely, you know, it's a new, new place, in, it's a new piece of the marketplace, right, where, where customers are going, and, uh, and businesses as well, right? So, so figuring out how to, to, to uh, capture data from, from, you know, things where we'd normally capture data, right? So think about, you know, they just added IoT devices to cars, right? There's, there's been this kind of mass influx into that area. Um, you know, there was a there was a push a while back to add them to appliances, right? I think there'll be a push for that again, right? Since there's some standardization to that, um, but there's lots of things that you can do, right? From an IoT perspective, um, not only from a commercial perspective, but think about it from a an enterprise or a or you know something like a Nest thermostat, right? I mean, as a consumer device, right? There's a there's a lot of good ways um, to take IoT um, and implement them, and and I think that it's a little bit different. I mean, it's still software development. Right, but then it turns into big data, right? Because now we're just really capturing data from devices that are going to help us understand how either users are using our products and applications, or, or you know, how we might actually uh, gain some efficiencies in our applications by getting data from those places. Right. That, that is spot on. So you know, a lot of times when I talk with folks about IoT and I say, "What does it mean to you?" Mm -hmm. They come back to say, "Yeah, it's thermostats, and it's watches, and it's eye eyeglasses, and it's cars and refrigerators." buildings, street lamps, it's, it's right. essentially everything, right? And really what they're saying is, to them, it's all about the devices. And I think, I think that's accurate. That's how we're seeing it um, being realized for us, you know, as, as consumers. We're seeing uh, all of the things in our life become uh, connected right. and uh, becoming connected to the Internet. And, and you know, what does that really uh, uh, turn into? And you, you talked about uh, the data. But... Let me ask you a couple of questions. We're really going to dig into this. How many PCs on, uh, do you think there are on planet Earth? I saw your next slide, so oh. go ahead and say two billion. <laughs> you cheated. <laughs> I cheated All right. a yes, bit. it's true. There are two billion PCs on planet Earth. Right. Right. How many think there's going to be in the next five years? Well, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. How many mobile phones do you think there are? I'm going to pretend I didn't look at your slide. I'm going to say seven billion. Well, there are about seven billion people, but it turns out there are about 10 billion oh. mobile phones. Some people with two phones. Some people at least have two, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it kind of a, uh, gives you a sense of scale, right? Two billion PCs, 10 billion mobile phones. But how many devices do you think will be connected to the Internet by, let's say, 2020? Um, I'm guessing, you know, there'll be a, at least 300 billion. Right, so, so there's some mul multiplier, right, that will connect that. So, yeah, so the estimate is about 250 billion right. devices connected. And what are all those devices going to be doing? So basically every piece of clothing, uh, every, every uh, 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 appliance in your home, it seems, you know, every, every car, every right. building, every street lamp, everything's going to be connected and feeding data, right? So at the end of this, it's really all about the data, right? Right. It's the data that's going to explode. We're going to have all these cool gadgets, but to what end? Well, what businesses want is they want the data, and that's why Internet of Things has become so popular in the last several months, and why my team is out doing Internet of Things engagements all the time now, is because businesses are saying, we want access to the data. 
They want to get it off the devices in real time. They want to put it into uh, environments that, first off, can handle the influx right. of exabytes of data, you know, huge amounts of data. And then they want to do analytics on it. Right. And they want to do real time analytics and they want to do historical analytics. And I think most importantly, where it starts to get a little both interesting and a little creepy. <laughs> a little bit of prediction. They want to do predictive analytics. Right. They want to predict the future. Um, you know, and all of a sudden it starts to feel like minority report, right? Right. Um, and, and, but, but the idea is that they want to take the combination of historical data uh, and, and build a model and then ask questions of the model and say, what will, what will this, these consumers decide to do with our product in the future? Right. Or you know, you know, whatever the question is that they want to ask. So, so the end of this game is collect as much data as you can and try to predict the future. Right. So when I think about IoT is I really see it as, as an end-to-end -end kind of solution. And I think as architects, we are very attracted to the devices, but you know, if we really think about it from an industry perspective, not all of us are gonna be sitting writing firmware for all of these right. really cool devices. Some of us will, and that's a really cool job. And I love hacking on the uh, you know, on the on all the kits that you can get, you know, that are based on the Arduino boards or the uh, Netduinos and some of the other uh, you were telling me about Spark IO, Spark IO right. chipsets and and so on. I mean, this is very cool stuff. Right. But what are we doing there? We're actually we're creating some software that's going to run on this little device, but it's going to connect up to the cloud. And it's going to se start sending messages. It's right. going to send them very often, you know, uh, several times a second possibly, um, and then. Our hope is that if you're in, as if you're, if that's your product, is you want tens of thousands or millions of people with your device, and therefore tens of millions of devices are now connected to the cloud right. and sending messages every few seconds. Right. You start to see the scale of this thing. So number one is device management, right? So you need to have a way to manage all those devices, which might be you know delivering firmware um, and providing uh, the necessary connectivity. To, uh, to the cloud, so that, that could be um, either from a third party, you know, usually it's third party libraries that you'll use to put on those devices stacks that you can use to make connections to things like Event Hub, as we'll see, as a, as a service endpoint. Right. You need the ability to do event ingestion or message ingestion and transformation at incredibly high volume. And that's the role that Event Hub and Stream Analytics play, and we'll see that in a little bit. The next part of the solution is status and notification. So you want to take all that information and you want to start to put it into the proper storage uh, locations. And there's going to be um, what, a, what a lot of our customers want is they want the ability to see real time status of what's going on on those devices. Right. So they all want real time dashboards. Um, and by the way, they usually want it on a really big screen, right? So they, <laughs> they want this really beautiful, responsive design, um, gorgeous UI showing them at a high level everything that's going on with their devices. You know, green if everything is good, yellow if there's an issue, red if that's something needs to be alerted. And that's where the notifications come in. Okay. You may need to pluck out of this, this in, in, incredibly uh, uh, large stream of information messages that require instant notifications to be sent. Right. And so that might be um, notifications up into these uh, visual displays. It could be notifying someone on their, on their mobile phone that they need to you know, be aware that a patient's temperature has gone beyond a certain point and, and they need to now attend to that patient all right? Right. As, as, a, as, a, as a micro example. But you know, uh, status and notifications are key. <clears throat> and how do you do that when you're dealing with these huge amounts of information coming right. in? Finally, the analytics and the visualization. They want to be able to uh, stage the information, uh, bring it into environments like HD Insight, use Hadoop, MapReduce, uh, and do that historical reporting. They want to bring it into um, maybe you know, existing data warehouses. Uh, they want to bring it into machine learning and do predictive analytics. Right. Uh, they want real-time dashboards, and we'll see an example of that today. <clears throat> and of course, integration. Our internal line of business systems are not going away. Um, at some point, maybe not all that data, but some of that data is probably going to find its way back into our internal systems. And so we need interoperability. So you need to really think about IoT as this end-to-end -end, um, space. And what would be a good approach to, to building a solution that provided all these capabilities? Well, microservices is what we've been talking about today. Right. Is a perfect a pattern for a solution that needs to deliver this series of, of capabilities. Right. Very cool. So 
The first uh, 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 microservice we want to talk about that's part of Azure is called Event Hub. All right, so we're going to do an overview of Event Hub, and then we'll go uh, we'll do an overview of Stream Analytics, and then we'll go look at how those are configured uh, in Azure, how you set those up. So Event Hub is essentially a um, highly scalable ingestion endpoint that you can you set up and configure in Azure. Um, it's designed, by the way, it's part of Service Bus. So when where do you find Event Hub? You go to Service Bus, and there, of course, you can create queues and topics and relays, but you can also create event hubs. And event hubs are different than those other aspects of Service Bus, which are um, really designed more for enterprise messaging that has requirements around you know, dead, dead letter uh, uh, management and um, uh, sequencing, transaction support. In event hub, we're not really looking for that kind of capability. What we're looking for is incredible scale. So event hub is designed to be an endpoint that can actually take in tens of millions and if you configure it as high as it, it could easily handle hundreds of millions of messages a day. Uh, and what it's going to do is take those messages in, and it's going to put them in a repository, and it's going to hang on to them for some amount of time that you configure, anywhere from 1 to 30 days. After that time frame, they go away. Message arise, uh, arrives, and you've configured it for a time to live of one day. 24 hours later, it's gone. So the concept is it's going to be a temporary store for all of those uh, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of messages. You then, it's a, what's expected is you have another microservice whose job is to go into Event Hub, query against all the messages that are in there, take out the ones of interest, and move them to the next stage of processing. Right. Um, so that's what uh, Event Hub does. Now the way that uh, it works is it uses what's called a partitioned consumer pattern. A partition is simply an ordered sequence of events that are held in Event Hub. So these messages come in, or events, whatever you want to call them, and it puts them into these partitions, uh, and it uh, is just adding new ones onto the end of the list. So you can think of this as a, as a commit log, um, uh, but, but these, these individual partitions are incredibly scalable. They can scale to one uh, megabyte of ingress incoming data and two megabytes of egress, so outgoing data. So, so you know, if you think about that, if you had a 1K message, which is a pretty big message, right. you could do, you know, a thousand of those a second, right? If your message was, um, you know, 10K, right, do the math, all right? You can do a lot more per second. Right. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, Event Hub can take in these messages, which are typically not that big, uh, they're coming from lots of these devices, and they're, they're usually sensor readings, right? Here, here are my five sensor readings. Boom, you know, it sends it up the cloud and does that maybe five times a second or something like that. Right. Well, those messages are all coming into Event Hub, being, being placed into a partition, um, and have this time to live. The other end, of, on the other side, you, you want to be able to read these messages out of Event Hub, and that's referred to as an Event Hub consumer. So, the, uh, so a partitioned consumer pattern is you've got a Event Hub containing you know, multiple partitions. By default, when you set up Event Hub in Azure, it will have 16 partitions. Um, you can lower that number at definition time down to 8. You can increase it to 32. If you need more than 32, if you need more than 32 megabytes of ingress per second, all right? Right, it's a lot. <laughs> do the math. Um, right. <laughs> take your message size, do the math. If you need more than that, you can actually call Microsoft and you can get up to 1024 partitions configured uh, into your Event Hub. Wow. So this thing can get huge, right. a single instance of Event Hub. Um, so by default, all of the messages and events, the events that are coming in, are going to essentially be placed into partitions in a round robin fashion. So partition one through sixteen, let's say, message comes in, comes in, comes in, comes in. It's going into each of the partitions. Start over again. Do one to sixteen, one to sixteen, and so on. Um, but you can target particular partitions, you know, uh, with your um, certain types of messages. You might say, "Well, I want to put all, you know." these kinds of messages into partitions, you know, one, two, and three, and this type of message should go into four, five, and six. Okay. You can do that if you, if you want. Most solutions I've seen so far, the uh, you know, default number of partitions is plenty scalable, and the round robin approach works pretty well. Right, and so really, really the, the, the real gist of that is, is saying, hey, great, like you 
do the number of partitions for the ingress that you think you're going to need, right, from, right. from all your applications. And it can grow as you grow, right? So if you start off with four um, in your application, you're deploying more devices, and more devices are putting data into your um, event hub, you can just increase the partitions to increase the, the bandwidth, right, in? Yes, sort of. <laughs> One thing you have to be aware of with event hub is the number of partitions on, at this time, anyway, is hard coded as it, and it's set at definition time. So once you create a vent hub, it's going to ask you how many partitions. Okay. If I say 16, then it'll be 16, and it's hard coded. I can't change it after that. So if you need more than 16 at some future date, you'll need at this point you'll need to say create a new event hub, begin to point your devices at the new event hub, and essentially you know. Uh, uh, migrate devices off the older event hub configuration to the new event hub configuration. Okay. That's just the way it works today, um, you know, and uh, we can certainly may expect that to you know, change in the future, but that's the way it works today. Okay. Um, so then, now let's talk about stream analytics. Yes. So as I talked about, you, you know, the, the, once all of those messages are sitting in event hub, you need a way to, to get them out because they have a time to live, right? Well, you can custom code an event hub consumer. There's an SDK for that. And you could write that microservice. And its job is, again, do one thing and do it well, right? right. Read the messages out of uh, event hub and move them to the next stage of processing, whatever that is. Could be placing them into storage. Could be you know, of examining the messages and, and you know, sending them off to, to other microservices uh, for processing, whatever it happens to be. Um, but, but Microsoft. Uh, uh, in their wisdom, said, you know, we ought to have a, uh, a microservice that provides consumption from Event Hub and does it at a much um, a higher level of abstraction. And that's what Stream Analytics is. It is a way to do consumption from Event Hub at scale and makes it really straightforward uh, to do it. So essentially, it's a fully managed, real-time computation service hosted in Azure, providing uh, this ability to um, read the, the streams of messages coming out of Event Hub, uh, use a SQL-like language in the way that you query those messages, right. and then direct them to various different uh, storage locations on the back end uh, for, for downstream processing. Uh, so it's a great, uh, it essentially has the same scale metrics as Event Hub. So it's a great you know, combination. So you know, cool. whatever level of scale you need for Event Hub, Stream Analytics can be configured to essentially be an equivalent service. So they, they work really well together. On the back end, the data can be written to uh, blob storage, to table storage, to SQL database, or to another uh, Event Hub. So you can actually have cascading event hubs, which okay. I think is interesting. Uh, you know, uh, I haven't come across the scenario yet. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a client to come to me and go, yeah. but you need cascading event hubs, because this would be fun to set that up. Uh, but the idea is you've got, let's say, all messages coming into one event hub. Stream Analytics says, well, we're going to trim this a bit, and we're going to take this subset, send it over to this other event hub, where maybe we do further processing on it, and we just get down to the messages of interest. So you, know, you, can, you can set up that cascading um, um, effect there. Now, the, with the integration with Event Hub, so Stream Analytics is capable of handling that event through, but of up to one gigabyte a second. So it, it can handle the, that, that uh, uh, volume of data at the velocity um, that it's going to be coming in at. Um, so it can ingest you know, millions of events per second. And um, Stream Analytics also provides support for partitioning while processing those ingested events. So you can actually write your queries such that they target particular partitions. Okay. So if you've set it up that way, you can do that. Um, and uh, over time, Stream Analytics will automatically scale based on the event ingestion rate, the complexity of processing, expected latent latencies, and so on. So now that we understand the um, event hub and the role it plays, and stream analytics and the, and the role that it plays, let, what I want to do now is I want to walk you through this home biomedical microservice demo. Okay. And we're going to look at each of the components that we've put in place. And you know, thinking about, you know, you know, is that a microservice? You know, based on everything we've learned today. And I think right. at the end, you're going to come out, yeah, each one of these components is right. itself a microservice. And what we've done to solve the solution for the business is we've composed them uh, through configuration and through code. And, right. I, and this is one of the interesting things I've seen 
um, as Azure evolves and becomes you know, richer and richer with, with these off-the-shelf services, is in some cases you don't have to write any code. Right. It's a configuration exercise. It's a DevOps exercise. Right. And yes, I, when I have to write code, I'll do it. But if I don't have to write code and I can just use a service off the shelf, do the configuration, talk about time to market. Yeah, and I think that's a really key point too, right? And thinking about you know, microservices and some of the, so, so the ones that you write and the ones that are available for you, right? Just how you compose them and construct them um, and even maybe put those under the API management, right? So they look like APIs, right? Even though there are other Azure services and you know, potentially you could write to them like that, right? They could become Absolutely. part of your APIs. Absolutely, everything so. is possible. So in the diagram I'm showing you now on the screen is uh, showing you how across the top we have sort of the business capabilities, right? Okay. We want it to be able to have these biometric devices. So the idea is we're going to have 300 patients that are each wearing a device that's going to provide four or five biometric measurements and provide those sensor readings five times a second, all right? So all those 300 devices sending five messages a second um, up to Event Hub. And so the message ingestion then is handled by Event Hub. The data acquisition and, and um, manipulation of the data, so we can do some uh, a bit of transformation, and we'll see some examples of the different kinds of queries that we can construct in Stream Analytics, uh, is done at that, at that point in the pipeline. And then Stream Analytics will actually write out data to both blob, table, and SQL database. Okay. And we'll be writing different messages of different types to these locations, as we'll see for different purposes. The next step is data transformation. So um, uh, I've written a custom microservice. This is the patient M microservice. And what this one does is it's going to read the data coming out of SQL database, but it, it always returns the last 10 messages that were written to SQL database. So whenever you call it, you're getting 10 new messages. Um, and its purpose is to be married with Signal R and an ASP.NET website. So that Signal R is actually calling this service every few right. seconds to get the latest 10 messages. And then what Signal R will do is it uses WebSockets to push that information down uh, to the JavaScript in the browser, which picks up that information, dynamically displays it uh, cool. uh, on the screen. All right, so we're gonna walk through all of this and see how it was all put together. So the first thing I'm going to show you is I'm actually going to switch over to another virtual machine. And it, I guess, you know, it turns out if you want to connect um, biomedical devices to 300 people in three different cities, New York, Chicago, and Boston, there's a lot of paperwork involved. So um, I didn't go down <laughs> that path. So what I did instead is I wrote an application which is going to simulate right. these devices. And, and so what it's doing is it's using the Event Hub Client SDK to uh, create a, uh, a message for these biometric readings, and it's gonna send that message up to Event Hub um, uh, every, every uh, 200 milliseconds. So you can see it's a console application. As I scroll down, uh, the first line of code that's of interest is this one right here that says uh, Event Hub Client all right, equals create from connection string. So what I'm doing here if I just uh, hit a couple of carriage returns here so you can see what's going on. In Configuration Manager, I have two settings. I have the URI to service bus and the, and the name of the event hub uh, uh, there. So if I open up uh, my app config, it's thinking about it. And I scroll down a little bit, we'll see that I've got the endpoint for service bus. So when you define service bus, which is a namespace in Azure, you create okay. the namespace for your service bus, it's going to give you back a URL. And that URL will have, um, will, you'll be able to uh, append to that a, set, uh, a couple of security tokens. Um, and, there, and that's what you see here, uh, this shared access key. And we'll talk about the security of this in a moment. So please don't memorize that. That's my personal shared access key. <laughs> All right, and the other thing that uh, I need is the actual name of the event hub. So within the namespace for my uh, service bus is this event hub called patient readings. Right. All right. 
And I would just note here while you're going through this, you're showing us this in uh, C Sharp because you're using a, a generator, right? To Correct. Generate some of this. Um, there is definitely a, a REST API uh, for event hubs that you can actually write to. Um, so if you wanted to do that from a Node.js application on Socket.io or, exactly. or, yeah, or some of those things, right? Or on uh, uh, Spark.io, I should say, or Arduino, or some of those other type mechanisms that are IoT, uh, you can definitely just call the REST API to send messages, right? So it's accessible from all these devices. Exactly. So yeah, down on the device, you'll be using different languages, different, different uh, um, communication stacks uh, for, for realizing the, the code you want to write on the device. And if the device supported C Sharp, it would look like this. And uh, you know, but, but most of them don't. They're, right. they're going to be in some other uh, technology stack. So yes, just just the ability to, to invoke a REST API. If you can do that, right. you can you can you can send a message up to Event Hub. Right. So you know, pretty consistent pattern here. I'm creating an object called Patient Reading, and I'm actually going to start to put the data in there that I want to send up to Event Hub. So I'm sending the actual geolocation of the of this device. Um, whether or not uh, it's an alarm, so whether or not it's an alarm is based on if any of the readings are outside a particular range. And then of course I'm simulating readings for glucose, heart rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, uh, and weight, and then sending a, a reading time. I am serializing that to JSON and then sending it asynchronously up to Event Hub. Right. It doesn't get easier, right? It basically I'm sending JSON to an endpoint, right. to a REST API. Uh, the, the Event Hub C Sharp SDK just makes it easier for me to, uh, to do this simulation. So let me go ahead and start up this application, and it's going to start sending lots and lots of messages up to Event Hub. And again, this is another example of my extensive UI development. You can see the spinning cursor there. I put a lot of effort into that. Probably better than mine. I don't know if I'd have been spinning or not. <laughs> It's not spinning yet, so okay. there it goes. There, there we go. go, yay. All right, so now that it's spinning, impressive. we know it's sending messages. Very impressive. So let me uh, hop back to my other VM. And so let's see, what's the next thing I want to show you? Yeah, so let's go up to the portal. So up here in Azure, Azure portal, one thing I wanted to point out is here's the definition for service bus. So if I go in there, I can see that I can define queues and topics and relays and event hubs. So I actually have an event up here called Patient Readings, and I can click into that, and we can see that it had 16 partitions. And if I wanted to create a new event hub, I could come in here and give it a new one, MVA Demo, and I could you know, choose the region where I want that to be, the namespace, and here's where I'm going to say the partition count, right? So if I don't put anything, the default will be 16. Um, but I could say, you know, it's 8, or it's 32. And I could say the message retention, you know, I want three days. Right? So this is where I'm going to do this level of configuration. But if I go to configuration for patient readings, what we'll see is I can change the message retention value, but I can't change the partitions. Right. But another important thing that I can configure are what are called the shared access policies. This is how you're going to define secure access to your event hub. So someone who wants to send a message to your event hub needs to have a security token a, a, a placed into a header uh, when they make that REST call. Right. And so um, you can create multiple shared access policies. And what you see here is I've created three. And I've called them manage, send, and listen. So if I wanted to create a new one, right. let's say called demo, and I could say this has you know, send capability. Right. Right? So the idea is you're creating a security token that has just a certain amount of capability uh, for, for working with Event Hub, either just sending, just listening, or both. Right, and I have an example of that on my screen here where you can see actually the, uh, the post and then we have the, uh, the actual call with the, uh, with the key in it, right? And, uh, and then the actual like, data is the body. Beautiful. That. So there's a good example of that on the REST API. Excellent. All right, and so if we go back over to the Azure portal, um, here we can actually see uh, how we can you know, review these keys and, and get access to them, uh, the ones that have been, and we can regenerate them. We don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things you'll want to do is define them, and then I think Azure has a new feature, the, the key store, the key vault. Right. Um, and so combining the generation of these keys with the key vault, again, a best practice, so that you can uh, securely uh, manage them. So we have our event hub all set up with the right uh, uh, shared access policy. The next 
um, thing. We know that the messages are going there right now. Uh, so not API Man, we want to look at stream analytics. So we have stream analytics here. And um, if we look at uh, what I have defined, I have a number of jobs. So within your instance of stream analytics, you define a job. And um, a job is what will be associated with an event hub for input and then a storage, one or more storage locations for output. Now the way I've set up my, um, if I go to input for this particular, the patient reading SQL storage job, we can see that I'm connected to Event Hub. And on output, I'm going to connect to SQL database. But what's most interesting is the query. The query is, as you can see, it's a SQL-like language. And I say SQL-like because it's, it isn't exactly T-SQL. It will have some additional keywords that deal with time. Uh, and for dealing with um, uh, attributes that Event Hub is exposing. So, you know, it's like the SQL language so that, you know, you're comfortable in using it and allows you to kind of think, how am I going to get these messages out of this repository that Event Hub is exposing? And how do I select just the ones I want for this eventual storage location? So it's right. allowing you to essentially trim, trim the number of messages of interest of a certain type and then, and then direct them to a storage location. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm selecting columns of interest and I'm sending, I'm selecting them from input, which is event hub, and sending them to output, which is SQL. In this case, I'm grabbing everything and putting it in SQL database. Right. The other uh, query here, which is for sending to blob storage, patient readings blob storage, is essentially the same, except I'm actually generating an additional column. So, and it's called archived, and I'm setting the default value to N. So the scenario here is I'm sending all the messages to blob storage so that they can be archived. Right. You know, a lot of clients want this. They're saying, well, we we're taking in tens of millions of messages. I know some point I might want to go back and look at messages we received, you know, last year and do some an analysis on it. No problem. We'll send it to blob storage, which can handle, you know, huge amounts of, of data being placed right. there. We can actually flag uh, the data, whether or not it's been archived. And when we do archive it, set the flag to yes and either leave it there or move it to some other location if necessary. Right. Maybe it gets integrated to something uh, 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 internal or, or uses some other uh, backup uh, right. system. Right, or, or if you just keep dropping them there and, you know, daily files or whatever it might be, then you can take those and bring them into HD Insights, right? So if you want to do queue processing or do exactly. map reduce on them, right, you can do that. At and Oracle. that's a scenario a lot of our clients are doing. So they actually want to stage in blob storage prior to being ingested into Hadoop right. um, or, or machine learning. Right. Um, so, so Azure Storage, you know, that's why Azure Storage is a, you know, one of the default options with Stream Analytics is it helps you stage for those analytics engines. Right. The next query is a little more interesting. It's going to get to slightly more interesting. And in this case, I'm selecting uh, many of the same columns, and I'm actually uh, generating uh, an, another column, which is called notified, with its value set to end. And I'm sending this one to table storage. Okay. And the only messages I'm sending to table storage are the ones that actually raise an alarm. So if any of the readings are outside particular range, I want to send those, so I have a where clause. I'm saying where is alarm is one. So I know one of the readings, temperature or glucose or blood oxygen level, is out of range. So now what I can have is downstream processing that's looking at table storage and saying, let me go through each of these readings, determine what is out of range, right. and then notify the appropriate individual or application right. that, that this has happened. So I'm separating out the alarms from everything else. Right, and you pick table storage as that, but you could also just as easily have you know, picked another Event Hub, right? So that there's yes. another like application like reading from Event Hub. That might be the good, a good scenario a very good for scenario, another, right. another Event Hub. Think about that one. Gosh, I'm excited now, I'm gonna go home and implement that. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> now one thing I wanted to do is show you an even more complex query. So here is an example where we're actually selecting um, uh, this thing called message, right? That's what we're actually going to call um, the, the messages we're pulling out, which is saying we're going to call them message. And we're actually selecting the ones uh, where flag is not null. Now, flag is not a value. It's an actual property in the JSON. 
So we're saying if this message has a property flag, um, then we're interested in it. If we don't see this thing flag, then ignore that message. So we're actually, it's a case where you can actually query over the properties of the JSON. In addition, you could also query over the values that are in the property. So it's an interesting distinction I wanted to call out. Then what we're, gen we're here, we're generating a unique ID using different values like the event NQ time. Uh, we're looking at an array index and a message event ID, combining it into a unique ID. And then we're pulling out uh, values out of the message and we're actually dereferencing the JSON here. We're saying you know, message.event ID and a message.model number. These are values that are at the top level of the JSON message because this is a hierarchical JSON message, right? And one of the things that this message has hanging off of it is an array. I see that. And so this line right here, right here allows you to actually say, well, I actually want to work with that array. So I know that let's say there's 10 elements in that array. I have one JSON message with an array of 10 elements. I want to flatten that out and put it into table storage. So how would you do that? Well, what will be generated here is a row in storage for as many elements as you have in the array. Right. And so what, what will be there will be consistent. These three values will be consistent in every row, and these values will be unique in every row. So that's how we can take arrays in this hierarchical JSON structure and flatten them out into rows in a table. Very cool. All right, so now if we go back, we can see, oops, I jumped off of that. I want to show you that now all of our three jobs are processing. So we're actually now processing um, uh, messages out of Event Hub, and they're being sent to table storage, to blob storage, and to SQL database. So let's go take a look at that. So first thing we'll do is we'll bring up SQL database. So I'm using uh, SQL Management Studio. So it's probably a tool that everyone is pretty familiar with. And it's a SQL as a service, right? I'm connected to SQL database as a service in Azure. Okay. And the, the name of the uh, database is patient readings. And there's a table called patient readings. You can see I got really clever with my naming yeah. here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and execute uh, this query. And you can see right now I've got 2,045 rows uh, in SQL database. So I've, that's probably kind of small to see. So let me zoom in on that. Uh, right there. All right, you can see I've got 2045 rows. Let me run this query again. And now there's 2,111. All right, so we know that there's, you know, data is just being poured into this SQL database. Right. Um, the same is happening for our Azure storage. Now, this is a tool called Azure Management Studio from Sarah Brada. And, um, I have found it uh, incredibly useful for dealing with Azure storage. And if you're working in IoT, you're working with Azure storage, it's just part of the deal. It's part of the way you're going to uh, put these solutions together. So we're using both blob storage, and let me show you that. When I configured <clears throat> blob storage for output from my stream analytics job, I could actually say what kind of file format I want. My choices were I could leave it as JSON, I could put it into um, or I could put it into a, a comma delimited, or I should say a CSV formatted file. Right. So essentially, I'm getting a spreadsheet. So if I go ahead and I, and I click this, in theory, Excel should open up. I'll cross my fingers for you. There we go. And you can see that I'm getting you know, all the data here in spreadsheet format in blob storage. Very so cool. think about, you know, maybe some of the downstream processing is you've got someone in your company who loves spreadsheets, you know, and they're going to say, you know what, hey, just get me a spreadsheet of all that data coming in for our devices. Hey, not a problem. I can, I can just configure that. Right. You know, I didn't have to write any code. I just said, send everything to Event Hub, stream analytics job, produce a spreadsheet, boom, I'm going. Right. Um, I know in preview that uh, the stream analytics team has, uh, they're, they're allowing you to try out stream analytics sending directly to Power BI. So I'm excited right. to see how, yeah, that, cool. how that turns out. That's going to be very cool, to, you know, being able to visualize uh, all of this. And as I said earlier, I'm also sending to, to table storage. So here uh, is an example where just the data where is alarm is equal to true all right, is being sent to table storage. Again, I'm just being able to uh, uh, view this data here. <coughs> um, using this tool, Azure Management Studio. So the use case for this is, as we talked about earlier, is I could have a microservice which is you know, looking at this data and saying, OK, let me um, read a row out of table storage. 
I will then you know, make, do the right thing as far as notification goes. And when I write it back, I will set notified to yes. Right. right? So, so uh, the, the, I was able to generate a column dynamically uh, and, play, and default it all to the letter N. And now I can go back and set this to yes once I've dealt with it. Um, the uh, uh, you know, interesting thing here with table storage is I didn't really, again, have to write any code or configure anything. I simply told Stream Analytics, write it out to this container, this, this storage container as, right. as a table, and it just took care of the rest. Yeah, one uh, of the great things being dynamically created. Yeah, one of the great things about table storage like that too is it's, it can be big, right? So there's, it's just like storage, right? Blob storage, there, it can get really big. Um, it's, it's really flat and it's, and it's, uh, and it's, it's resilient, right? So, so, so the service is running, it's software as a service, so it's not like it's SQL running somewhere on a VM that you're running, right? It's, it's actually a service that's running that's fault tolerant. Exactly. Now, one of the things uh, we're not really covering uh, in, this, in this example is, and, and uh, as, as uh, you know, my, my team has worked with clients, we've discovered you know, it's an additional piece of the solution is you probably need to have you know, additional um, uh, either automation jobs, right. PowerShell scripts, or other microservices which are going Bad to jobs. take care of taking this data where we're kind of dumping it in real time and taking it and, and archiving it off in, in some form um, and then you know resetting the stores as they are uh, in the cloud that are receiving the real time data. Right. And just, uh, you know, it's not hard to do. It's just, again, you got to think about um, if this thing runs for six months, you know, at some point you're going to probably hit, you know, the, the hundred terabyte limit of, of your Azure storage container, I would think, at some point. Right, I think at that's some the point. Limit. Maybe I just made that up. Hopefully you right. spread it out, right? <laughs> so anyway, so if we go back to um, uh, Azure again, what I'm showing now is API management. So as I said, I actually have written a fairly simple microservice. It's based on the same pattern that we saw in module three. And it's called the uh, patient M microservice. And if we look at the settings, I should say the operations, it has three operations that it can perform. It can, it can look into SQL database. And we saw that before. We looked at the data going into SQL database. Right. And it will read the last 10 rows, but it'll, it'll do it by patients by city. So you could say, show me the last 10 messages that came from the patients in New York and it'll send you back those, just those 10 rows. It'll also do a bit of a um, uh, uh, transformation because the data is just flat in SQL database. Right. But my application wants more of a hierarchical JSON structure or object model. So things like the geolocation are, are a sub uh, object and the, the vital signs are another sub object and the patient information is at the top level. Right. So it essentially takes the flat data, turns it into a hierarchical model, uh, and then it, it passes that back on the wire. The other is vitals by city. So this is essentially another pivot, right? So what my microservice is doing is it's not only just getting the last 10 by city, but it could also do it vitals by city, in which case that's a different message format. Right. So it's saying just send back the last 10 uh, glucose readings from Chicago, right? right. So, so being able to pivot on this information was something that you know, we had to put that logic into the microservice itself. And finally, there's vitals by patient ID. So now what will be interesting is to go and look at this information coming back, right? Now that the, the data is actually flowing into the systems, this microservice will actually do something now. Right. So we go back to our developer portal. We've, uh, we've configured the API. We'll go to its uh, console page, the patient M microservice, and we can see there are three operations, and I can actually try it out. So if I go ahead and I try it, I'll see that I can enter a city. And because back on the configuration, if I show you patients by city, on the parameters, I actually put in default values. I think this is a cool feature of API right. management. I know that that, should, that parameter should either be the word all, Boston, Chicago, or New York. Right. It's never anything else. So why not uh, you know, provide that level of documentation and provide that, that then gets translated into a capability here on the console, the developer console. Right. So I'm going to say, show me, you know, everything from uh, New York, just patients, the last 10 readings, and do a, do a send, and I get the okay response, and I come back, and there's, there's the JSON, right? Very cool. So I'm getting, I'm getting that package back, 
And if I said, you know what, send, uh, show, me, uh, show me Chicago and do send. No, not Cortana, thank you, but no thank you. Um, <laughs> and there it is, there's uh, an, uh, Chicago. And how do I know Chicago? This is information coming from Chicago. Well, I have all of the longitude and latitude readings memorized for right. these three cities. That's impressive. That's a, <laughs> so that's how I know that the, that information is coming from Chicago. Uh, let's look at vitals by city. So again, this is a different pivot, right? Here I'm interested in, in you know, again, I've got default settings. Is it glucose, temperature, heart rate, or oxygen? Let's choose oxygen for Boston. And let me go ahead and send that request to the microservice. And now I get back just the information for, for, for that vital reading for folks who happen to be in Boston. And you can tell it's Boston because of the longitudinal attitude readings. There you go. So now we have our patient microservice being able to return the information of interest to our application. So what's our application? Well, our application happens to be um, uh, an ASP.NET web application, MVC. It's using um, Angular, Bootstrap, D3 right. on the front end. Um, and that code is invoking um, uh, it has a Signal R component that's running on, on the uh, server. So if you're interested in Signal R, ASP .net, search ASP.NET Signal R. Uh, there's a whole set of tutorials online about uh, how to use Signal R in different configurations. Uh, in this example, um, it's, uh, the, the example that I used for this uh, was, was the one that uh, I think does a stock ticker. So if right. you look at that tutorial, Signal R stock ticker, it shows you how to define uh, 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 signal R on the server side so that it, it's uh, invoking um, a service and then generating a model. So we're, again, we're, what are we getting back? Mm -hmm. the, the patient or vital information. And how to then have a connection over WebSockets down to a JavaScript function that's in the browser. Right. And signal R will make the call and push the data down to the browser. Make right. the call, push the data down to the browser. So it just automatically does that and does it over WebSockets. Right. And, and it does it continually. So if I now run the biometric dashboard, and I bring this up, this application is going to come alive. And you can see the, the, um, uh, the readings are coming in for the three different cities, Boston, Chicago, and New York. And as we start to get more and more uh, patient readings, we're going to see them kind of light up on the map because they each have a different longitude and latitude uh, location. Right. We're seeing the readings come in, and by default, they're aggregated across the, uh, the four uh, readings there. But if I hover over uh, Chicago, now I'm just seeing Chicago data, uh, right? And if I, if I hover over New York, I just see New York data, or I can see the aggregate. So what this is is an example of how we can actually take the real-time data coming from devices, manage it at, at incredibly high volume coming through Event Hub, determining storage locations in stream analytics and doing additional transformation and adding right. columns uh, to the results and placing that into either you know blob and table and SQL database storage, I'm sure in other locations in the future, right. and staging that for downstream consumption by applications like this to produce a real-time visualization. Right. And how is it done? All with microservices. Right. Yeah, that's really a really good key point, right? It was microservices. It was uh, microservices that you created with Patient M. There's some other configuration that you did, um, and then and then using out of the box Azure services, right? The microservices that are provided with Azure. Uh, you use Event Hub. You use Stream Analytics, right? Um, using Blob Storage, SQL as a service, right? So there's nothing that you stood up that's not an Elastic service, right? Exactly. So everything is elastic. Everything elastic. Scalable. It can scale. Um, and scale really big at some point, right? Yes. So if you needed to. Uh, so that's a really good implementation of uh, showing my, how microservices are kind of all put together in composition to make an application work, um, such as the one you just showed us, which is really cool. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I hope that uh, the folks viewing found that uh, useful and interesting. And yeah. uh, as I said, you know, how do you get started with all of this? Uh, you know, it's uh, learn about continuous delivery. Right. Um, take the skills, like good engineering skills. Don't. Don't, don't go throw away. them out the window, right? No, you keep them. Uh, you know everything you know about doing good API design um, applies. Maybe dust off that domain-driven uh, design book by Eric Evans and, right. and get back to doing good domain modeling. Find the microservices in your environment and uh, try it out. You know, do one and see how see how it fits, see how it feels. And right. If you're in the IoT space, uh, I just kind of laid out for you. The, uh, the, the, the pattern, which is, which is going to be pretty uh, consistent across the board, and again, I'll go back to the diagram here. This is a, uh, a pretty 
um, repeatable pattern as far right. as IoT is concerned, and, and add into the mix your HD Insight Hadoop and your machine learning for, for your uh, historical and, and, and predictive analytics. Right. And you've got, you know, you've got all the pieces of the puzzle that you need to put together uh, for a complete solution. That's very cool. And uh, okay, so that ends our session here. So uh, Bob, I want to thank you very much for coming out uh, and thank uh, you joining very us in the studio. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, we appreciate the wisdom. And I want to thank you as viewers for uh, taking the time to uh, watch our session today on microservices and, uh, and Docker and Microsoft Azure. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, you're going to see a survey or a poll at the end of this. Um, it would be great to get feedback from you um, if you have the time to fill that out for us. And uh, we want to thank you and uh, have a great day.